there was something you wanted to kind of bring up on there and I'll let you kind of take that away. Like in terms of like how younger creatives can build a career in this, in this day and age as a, as a sports creative. So it, you should definitely shoot for the stars, but like you don't have to get there today. That's the thing people don't understand is like <clears throat> everyone that wants to work like in football, they're like, I want to shoot the NFL. Yeah. And it's like, you need to shoot local football, high first. school ball, high school football, college football. You have to like, start and and get your skills and it's like you can't go right to the top right away right it's just it's not how it works like you don't like my buddy jamie price he always says you don't walk in your first day of medical school and be like hey scalpel let's do heart surgery they're like no that's not how it works like you have to like learn and develop right and everyone wants to go straight to f1 the amount of people that message me i really want to get a job in f1 like how do i get a job in f1 and i'm like what racing have you shot they're like none i'm like Right. So like you, you want to go straight from off the street to playing in the NFL. Like that's not how it works. Like you just start, start some, start somewhere smaller. And people are like, Oh, well, I don't, I can't have enough money to buy a camera. How can I learn, you know, how to shoot with your phone? You can learn composition with your iPhone. hundred percent. You can download one of those free apps that has better control of your camera. I think that's like one of the biggest things is like, just go out there and do the thing just before do shit. There's always something you can shoot. All right, and welcome back to the Sports Creative Showcase. We are here with episode 13 here, and we have an incredibly hardworking and very unique creative joining us. Mark Urban is a content creator based out of Toronto who has spent the last few years creating unbelievable video content in the motorsport world, traveling the globe to what seems to be almost on a daily or weekly basis to work some of the biggest racing events in the world, all while showcasing your process online and also building your own personal brand while working with some of the biggest car brands and companies in the world. Mark, welcome for the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you for making the time to be here. Uh, how have you been, man? You uh, you have a pretty busy travel schedule coming up, and you're just coming back. You're a little yeah. jet lagged. Uh, how have you been? I'm very sweaty, and my heart rate's very high. I'm still very <laughs> jet lagged from my from my last trip. I just got back from Malaysia two day, uh, three days ago, mm-hmm. so I'm pretty tired. But yeah, it's been a crazy year. I've done a lot of stuff. I'm almost done. I have one more trip next week for three days, and then I'm done. Yeah, you leave tomorrow, my right? season will be like three weeks or something. And That's then we nice. start up again in January. At, so. least, at least it comes during yeah. the holidays where you kind of have True. that. You can spend that time with your family. You can spend that time with with you know the people that you care about, and you're not like, oh, mm-hmm. I got to like peace out for Christmas or New Year's. Um, so it's a nice change up. I feel like every time we've tried to plan this podcast, it's been like you have a window of like three days before you're back and forth. That's just making plans as an adult. Though. Yeah. It's like, what's your April like? You know? Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> yeah no, literally, it's like, like now that I'm like turning like I'm like in my mid 20s I'm like I, I realized my friends like oh you I can't just be like what are you doing tonight I'm like what are you doing three weeks from now Literally, but it's yeah. even it's even more hectic when you work in the in the sports industry like this and also in a industry like racing which does doesn't happen in your backyard you have to go across the Atlantic or across the Pacific to do it um, but like you said you've been you've been up to a lot you've had a very busy year and you're kind of finally winding down what has the last year been like for you what have you been up to for our audience who aren't familiar with your work uh, so it's been pretty wild. Uh, I've shot um, 33 events this year, uh, and so that's racing. That's mostly racing events. I, I also actually no, that's only racing events. Uh, that doesn't include like I did. I did a CFL game recently. Actually, I just shot the West Final in Winnipeg. Uh, and other, outside of that, everything's been racing. Other than I uh, shot the Queen's Plate for Woodbine, or sorry, the King's Plate as it's called now. Um, Does it change now? That the it king- changed because the I didn't Queen know, died. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know it changed to the Queen's. The King's Plate. They actually did a really cool launch video and everything to launch King's Plate as a brand. But so I shot that. But that was like that was a one day event. and It was thirty minutes from my house. So does does it really count? I don't know. But traveling in terms of like I only shot two events in Canada this year. Everything else was uh, international. Like, or did States. 10 countries in total. I visited, oh visited 12 this year and shot racing in 10. So quite a lot of stuff um, in one year. Uh, a lot of long trips that backed onto the end of the year. But the crazy thing is my year started on like January 8th. And so you come right out of New Year's and you're on you're yeah. you're on the you're on the road doing your thing. And then it was literally like five or six straight weeks. What's the uh, what's the air miles account looking like? What what how many miles do you have this year? We talked about it very yeah. briefly before so hopping on the podcast. Can proudly say uh, so. I usually fly Delta. I fly Sky Team Airlines. So it's Delta KLM. I feel like Delta is like the kind of the, be- the best one to go. go yeah, Delta is pretty solid. It's the best of like all U.S. airlines yeah. are pretty bad, but Delta is the best of the bad. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I have Diamond status. Nice. So for next year, oh so God. I'm pretty stoked about that. Yeah, that, yeah. I think that's the one. Better with what you do you might have yeah. to like take a lot like you have to deal with the jet lag but then you get free trips and you get you get all these and you gotta things. get a travel credit card things like that because it just makes traveling so much better when you have like lounge access yeah upgraded to first class you know it's not nice. so tip so. for anyone just wanting to get into this industry get into getting a points plan early especially yes. if you're going to travel that's my first mistake when i i read at the same like a final my first one two years ago and i didn't have a travel like i didn't i yeah. wasn't a loyalty member and i realized like oh sh- 
all those flights I took, I could have just gone to an, uh, to like to a, a loyalty and probably had a good like yeah. status by now. And that's something I wish I knew early on. Um, Give us some insight on what you do as a creative. You primarily work in the motorsport world. You have background in, uh, you know, the CFL and the and 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 the, with the Tiger Cats. But you know, what is kind of what do you title yourself and what have you what do you primarily work in? So the titling is weird because like we kind of live in a world where like we call ourselves creatives now, and yep. then, and and a lot of people say that sounds really pretentious or like you know oh well everyone's creative so I can call myself a creative. It's like well that's kind of what we call ourselves. But I refer to myself as a videographer. I I dabbled earlier this year with calling myself a cinematographer, but then it really triggered a lot of cinematographers on TikTok who were like, you're not a cinematographer. That's different. And I'm like, okay, you're right. Cause a cinematographer op like films, they operate a camera, they plan shots. A videographer usually shoots and edits their own stuff, right? So that's what I am. I'm a videographer and I'm a video content creator. I guess that's what I, I technically call myself. I, I like the fact that you own up to it and don't shy away from like the videographer title. I, Cause I, I, I kind of, yeah, I'm in the same boat where I'm figuring out what to title myself. Like, mm -hmm. in a sense, I feel like we qualify as cinematographers because I think there's a skill there's a skill that comes with cinematography with planning shots, like mm -hmm. being able to properly shoot. And I think you qualify in that, but it's also like there is so much more that goes into the cinematography realm, like lighting, like for sure, yeah. And then I think I, I see sometimes like I don't you you know like Nicole Shapiro, right? So her yeah. TikTok, like I see her TikTok videos, and I'm like I would be so lost on a film yeah. set. I wouldn't even know what to do. I'm like, wait, you have four people for that? I do all of that. Yeah, you know, and I only get. 15 minutes with the driver or whatever and I have to do it. But like you see that and I'm like, I'm, I'm so impressed by that and so blown away by it that like there's a team and everyone knows their role and they just bang things out. I, I think that the film world and the sports world are so different though. Like yeah. I think and and I'm not I'm not talking shit here, mm -hmm. but like I think there is a skill gap in the in in the creative industry in sports where you, there there are videographers, mm -hmm. but then I think people who are really talented of getting creative shots and making it look good should be qualified as cinematographers yeah. because they're there is a point where your work transcends of what a videographer is. And I think that's when mm -hmm. you're early on. So, but I also know that the cinematography community on TikTok can be very, uh, tough to, tough to get along with. And have, yeah. Have you been on threads? Uh, yeah, I trying it's to even worse. It's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I think, I think everyone in the sports industry is trying to, yeah. to figure out their place, but I, I like to hear sure. that, you know, you're, you're kind of accepting your, your brand as a videographer and a high level one at that, uh, shooting some of the biggest racing events in the world. Um, you, we talked about this before, but again, just for context for viewers who aren't familiar with you, um, you primarily work with, you work with teams and brands, but you also, uh, with teams and racers, but you also work with brands. Can you give yeah. us a little bit of insight of who your clientele is and what you're creating for them on kind of a monthly or yearly basis? So it's been a pretty wild year. This past year I've worked with um, like Lamborghini proper out of Italy. I've worked with uh, Aston Martin directly for Aston Martin uh, for BMW through an agency in Germany. So uh, a lot of these brands people don't realize when it comes to creative, they usually handle everything through agencies. So a lot of the time, like they don't touch anything. Like you're I not did. talking to someone with Mercedes. You're talking no, to someone. I'm talking to someone who then goes and talks to, to BMW. Yeah. Right? Like I, even did like an influencer thing for <clears throat> Lexus and I never saw anyone from Lexus. I just saw the people from the agency that managed their social media. Right. So it's all done usually through, through middleman through agencies. Now, when I work with drivers and stuff, 99% of the time it's directly with the driver. Sometimes it's with their agent. I'm um, doing a gig next year where I'll be shooting like, and it's through the agency that handles their PR. I've also worked for PR firms that handle teams where the PR firm is the one paying you. Right. So it's, it's pretty wild. There's a lot of different opportunities in motorsport. You can work for drivers, teams, brands, sponsors, uh, automotive manufacturers. There's like, I have a buddy that shoots almost all these races and he literally shoots for like an oil company that sponsors the cars. So there's so many opportunities to be involved. And I think that's a really good thing to know and something that I always push when I do these interviews and when I just do my own content is that you don't have to work for the team or the league or the organization yep. or the athletes directly. You can find opportunities with those brands or companies that are affiliated with, yep. um, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever sport you want to work in, whatever it, part of the industry you want to work in. There are so many ways in and around that. And I think that's a really cool thing you mentioned is that there are just other random situations you find yourself in meeting people who are associated with the sport and that gets you through the door. Mm -hmm. um, before we dive a little deeper into what you're currently doing and kind of the crazy life you live now, let's kind of wind the clocks back and kind of give me the con like the, um, give me your origin story as a creative. Okay. How did you, how did you get started? You know, how old were you back then? What did, what got you into it? And then how did you end up from there to where you are now? 
So I always had like a bit of an interest in filmmaking, like when I was in high school and stuff. So I took film class actually twice in high school. So I took it once in grade 11 and then once when I did like a, a victory lap, like what people would call OAC. If you're old enough to remember what grade 13 is, it's yep. even before my time. So I did an extra year by choice and I took film class again to kind of get my grade up, take it more seriously because I made stupid films the first time. So then I was like, you know what? I kind of want to go to film school. So I applied to uh, Toronto Metropolitan as it's called now. Yeah, that's where um, I went, yeah. Yeah, and every day I thank my lucky stars I didn't get in because I would have changed my life. It, like, I, I know quite a few people that went, and I'm not trying to hate on film school, but I know people that went that are not working in the film industry. It's now. the same with me. I went, I yeah. like did the sport media program up there, yeah. and I know so many people who are not working in sports anymore. Yeah, they, they a lot, and a lot of people went into a lot of debt to finance the short films that they made and stuff, like having to hire actors. And I just, I'm really glad I didn't get in. So I didn't get in, which is great. So I studied television broadcasting, went to Conestoga College in Kitchener. I lived in Kitchener, that's where I grew up. So I just took the bus to school every day and did that. And I did that for two years and I took a graduate year uh, for like documentary filmmaking. So enjoyed that. And then honestly, not a lot of jobs, didn't have a lot of drive. So I like, was like, I'm gonna go back to school because I wanted to play football. So I went back to school, I went to Waterloo and I studied like bird courses basically because I wanted to play football and then that didn't work out. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I took a job doing uh, AV, like audiovisual stuff at like a government think tank and I actually got fired after less than three months and I'll be fully transparent that I did not take that job seriously and I dicked around a lot and I deserved to get fired. Mm -hmm. So I got fired. And then that kind of changed my life. And then my buddy, Craig, was like, hey, the CFL has this like coordinator job. You should apply for it. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I applied for it. And then they like sent like the next day, they're like, hey, you want to interview you for this? And I was like, wow. Okay, what a turn! What a turnaround from getting <laughs> fired. So and then I, I like drove my wife to work. Well, my girlfriend at the time drove her to work, dropped her off, and then I drove into Toronto. And I got here like two hours early because I was like, do not want to be late for this yeah. interview. Right? You never know with traffic. So especially in this city, went in and like just had my interview. Went really well. Um, and they and they asked me like one of the questions Kyle Scott asked me in the interview was like, what do you think we could do better? And I like literally just ripped their content to shreds in front of them. I was like, this sucks. We could do this better. And they were like, really appreciate your honesty. <laughs> but at the end of the day, though, like you're bringing someone yeah. in. You're bringing someone in and you want to do change up yeah. and you're going to, I think it's important to understand that you got to take that criticism yeah. in this industry. So I'm glad they were, excuse me, I'm glad they were receptive to it and open to it. Yeah. And I was an Argo season ticket holder at the time. So I was a big CFL fan. You were anyway. familiar with the league. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So like uh, they, I got that job. It didn't pay very much. It was a junior coordinator. It was like one step. It was like paid internship basically. Yeah. And I was living in Kitchener. So I commuted every day, two hours each way. That's, that's I did a that for mission. a year. I eventually got hired on in like a contract like pretty quick after because they would like the work I was doing. So I worked at the CFL for a couple of years, 2016 season, 2017 season. And then 2018 season, I got an opportunity to work for the Tiger Cats, which I really took because it was closer to home. I was living in Milton at the time. We moved. It was closer. I could half hour commute and it was a little bit more money. You're not busing from kitchen. I, I, I'm yeah. Not, yeah, I'm not taking the train. Like I was spending like $4,000 a year on Go Train That's to insane. do a job I could do from home. Yeah. Right. You know, so. Um, How times have changed. Now exactly. If COVID. I could have telecommuted, I would have, I would have stayed at the CFL for sure. Yeah. But like, anyway, uh, took the job at the Ticats and then did, didn't really enjoy my time at Ticats, unfortunately. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, it was it was very much that like we're a family type thing. And I just, it, it was a tough situation. And I didn't care about the team. I wasn't a fan of the team. And when you're, if you're going to work for a team, you have to love the team. You have to love the sport. You have to, because like, if you don't have a passion for it, it becomes a job really quickly. And it was a job from day one. And I think this is the very particular industry where like you, if you don't love the team or the organization you mm -hmm. work for, and it becomes a job and not a passion, it's the yep. job and the passion that will burn you out and chew you up and spit you out really, really quickly. Yeah. So I, 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 it's, I love the fact that you're like being very transparent about that and, and, and mm -hmm. in that particular situation. So you were at the Thai Cats. What ended up, how did you end up transitioning uh, from there to uh, motorsport? So I always had a passion for motorsport. I always watched motorsport. I used to watch like NASCAR with my dad's side of the family. I used to watch uh, Formula One with my late uncle. I got really into watching Formula One with like and talking about it. So I'd make sure we could watch it every Sunday. So when I saw him, like we could chat about it. Um, so I always loved watching that and then decided like, you know what, I'm just gonna like go to some races. Like Nicole and I will go to some races like up at most sport, like Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. It's yeah. called now, um, up in Bowmanville and like take my camera with me and I'll just like film some racing and then like, I'll just like start asking race teams if they want me to work for them, like even for free, just cause like I want to do it and get some experience. I tried that season when I was at the Thai Cats, I was burning myself out working, but I was also like in my free time, I was shooting other sports. Like I went one night and shot baseball, like semi-pro baseball just down the street from my house. Cause like the light was nice and it was some of the best footage I've ever shot. Yeah. And then I shot racing. I did all kinds of stuff just to type kind of diversify. And then I eventually was like, you know what? I'm going to like use my position working at the tire cats to like as a professional, to like ask if I can get media credentials for these races. So 
there's an there was a IMSA race, which is a championship I work in now in Bowmanville. There's one every year. They come to Canada once a year. So I was like, I'm gonna ask the guy at IMSA if I can have credentials for this. And just by chance, there's a lot of these stories, like a lot of these by chance things in my story, but it's like the guy knew what the CFL was and he watched CFL games on ESPN too. Okay. Of all things. Right. Okay. And his intern at the time, uh, she, she went to Texas A&M and we had just signed Johnny Manziel. Ah. Right. So he, we signed him four, five days after I started working there. And I once, I can tell you, I once in one season, I directed Johnny Manziel and Ric Flair in green screen shoots. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I worked at the tire cat. So that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Um, that's something you keep in the back of your mind. Exactly. But the Johnny Manziel stuff, they wouldn't let us use any of it because, um, the ownership was concerned that if we put him in stuff right away, other players would be pissed because it's Johnny because, you know, so we didn't use any of it. But, but anyway, um, yeah, so he ended up giving me media credentials and he's like, Hey, just like, don't tell anyone, you know, it's like, you're don't tell anyone what you're there for. Like, it's fine. Just, he just gave you shoot. Like, just don't, fun. Be, yeah. don't be an idiot and yeah, just like, don't get, don't get some, me in trouble. Yeah. Get some experience, you know, be smart. So I went to my first race just on the Sunday. I didn't do the whole race weekend. I just went the Sunday morning and like just shot racing and had a great time. And I was like giddy as a child. And I was like giving stuff to people for free. I was like, Hey, I have this video I took of you just cause I was like, so you were just like in the moment. Yeah. I was, I was living, I was loving it. And then eventually, like, I was like, hey, next season, 2019, I, I want to go to the 24 Hours of Daytona. It's a race I've watched on TV so many times. I'm, Nicole and I are just, we're just going to go and enjoy it. I want to see if I get media credentials. I'm going to email my contact. He said, yeah, no problem. We can hook you up. And I said, hey, I'm going to maybe offer my services to some teams, like, for free. And he was like, okay, yeah, no problem. So we... I took care of that. And there was a team based in Woodbridge called AIM Autosport. And I was like, hey, I'll work for you guys for free for that race. And they're like, sure. So I went down and crushed it. And then like six weeks later, I quit my job with the Thai Cats and I went on the road with them as a freelancer. And, and now you're here. Worked every event and now here we are. Wow. So, well, yeah. That's a pretty, like yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, like you, you took your positioning and you took your, like mm-hmm. your authority in the industry working for a team already to find credentials. I think that's a really useful lesson for people to know. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is like, how did you start shooting? You mentioned you had a love mm-hmm. for film and you wanted to get, but how did you visit, like how did you start shooting your first sports games? Because, you know, not a lot of people like typically will just go to something like the CFL. It's still pro football Mm -hmm. how did you like actually physically start like using a camera what was that process like when did you okay um so kind of like around the college time i was just starting to do more videos about sports like i was starting to do more stuff with my friends about like players on you know laurier or waterloo and shooting more sports stuff did a little bit of like film work for the university of waterloo to shooting game film um i would shoot like soccer games like for kids parents that wanted like film i would just like you know, here's 50 bucks, shoot the game. I did that a lot actually. And that's just kind of how I got into it. And then I'm like, okay, I want to be more stylized here. So the reason I kind of left the CFL was we were transitioning into like, I wasn't getting paid a lot first off. And second, I was transitioning into like, oh, we're going to be more like the live stream shows. You're going to be like a live stream director. And I'm like, cool. So I don't want to do rather that. jump off a bridge than like fucking do that. So I, um, was like, I want to shoot. And we never really got to shoot ever. Did a little bit playoffs in 2017. Now it's very different now because I just shot a CFL game with Peter and the guys and it was like full on like cinema, like we're doing and this. And it's, it's so if it different. it was like that now, it'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this, so, this, that was, a, that was a, that would, that would yeah. have been like over five years ago, like yeah. roughly, right? So like, it's in this, like that whole side of the creative sports industry where what we are doing right now didn't exist five years ago. No. Like it only really started developing right before the pandemic. There was and then, no Instagram reels. There was no TikTok. Yeah. Like, no vertical video like yeah everything was 16 by 9 when it was nice yeah. now everything's fucking vertical and we hate yep. it but no it, it's really interesting to hear that that kind of development and then you using that and be like hey can i just come shoot this race and they just let you i think it's a really big lesson for young people like sometimes you gotta just ask and i've said it yeah. before like if you don't ask the answer is literally gonna be no well, it's very time. serendipitous i'll say that like it's just one of those moments where like if that guy didn't know what the cfl was he probably wouldn't have responded 100 percent Right. And then I also went to some races just as a fan. I mm-hmm. went to mid Ohio for the NASCAR race as a fan. I just shot from behind the fence. That's something I always tell people, just go do that. It's like sports car racing, all these racing series have so much access. Yeah. Just go and shoot. Yeah. You yeah. Know? No, for like, sure. One thing before we move fully into the motorsports things sure. is your time with the tie cats. Okay. Um, what was your role with them and what were you kind of doing on a day to day basis? And you mentioned that you were getting into that during the Johnny Manziel era. What was yeah. that experience like with a team who get it, gets a star like that, but all, but primarily yeah. like what was your role with them and what did you kind of do? I can't remember what the name of my position was, but I like basically had to do all the in-stadium program and then like video content as mm-hmm. well. So now I think more teams are, well, teams with bigger budgets have it more compartmentalized where it's like, okay, so you do the in-stadium stadium program. That's your only job. You do the video stuff. So it was myself, Corey Nusko, I think is still there. Yep. And then we had an intern um, who I will like. Corey's been there for that long. He's been there for a long time. Yeah. So he got hired about a couple months before I did. Mm -hmm. Um, So basically uh, we had an intern as well um, who was an unpaid intern. He was not getting paid. Like he was getting school credit. And uh, he's since 
kind of apologized to me that he did not take it seriously and he didn't give a shit because he wasn't getting paid. Interesting. He had an amazing opportunity and he didn't really take it. Yeah. So um, I basically ended up in the position where I had to shoot like media scrums every day. And then, so every day I would go to go to the office. Our office was not at the stadium. Every day I would go to the office in downtown Hamilton. I would be there for three or four hours, and I would go to the stadium for practice. I would shoot scrums, and then I would sit in the uh, Telus Media Center every day until the end of the day, working on the in-stadium program on my own personal laptop, which I bought when I started working there because they're like, "You don't have a laptop; you have a desktop computer." And I'm like, "I am not staying here every night until midnight working. Like, nope. I'm going to buy my own laptop so I don't <laughs> have to do that." So yeah, which is pretty wild, and. Yeah, it was it was a lot of work. When I got hired, they were like, "You have three weeks to make the in-stadium program for this year." I was like, "Great!" Oh, also, you have to shoot media scrums today. Like, you kind of got thrown into the fire. My third day there, I almost called the CFL to ask for my job back. I was very, cons- I was very much like, and also they were like, "Oh, by the way, we have a soccer team. We didn't tell you that in your interview, but you have to work for the soccer team." Is that all- the Forge? Yes, all off season you'll be shooting for the soccer team, which they framed as. Now we'll have something to do in the off season. It's great for everyone. Nobody got. And this a raise. isn't a. By the way, this isn't a shot at the Ticats. No, now. it's just like I, it's just back then. It was, it was just like it wasn't mentioned <laughs> in the interview that we had a soccer team because it was like no one knew it existed yet. Mm-hmm. But then it was just kind of like this is the first day I'm there. Like, oh yeah, the soccer team. I'm like, what soccer team? What, be, before we started the yeah. podcast, you mentioned you learned a lot through this process. Yeah, so I learned how much I can handle, right? Because it was so much work. There was a day or 27 days straight without a day off, right? And, but I was able to handle it by just, I never freaked out. I never lost my shit. I was just like, Hey, if something doesn't happen, it doesn't happen because I work here. I'm on staff. You know, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's not like I'm a freelancer. I'm going to lose this client. It's Mm -hmm. like, if this doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And I can only do so much work. And Corey worked his ass off too. He was there every day, super late every night. And he had a, more of a passion for it than I did because he cared more about the team, right? And that's why he's still there and he's still thriving. He's making incredible content. He's come so far from where he was then. And myself, I just didn't give a shit if Todd Cats won or lost. I think that I kind of didn't spe- speaks a lot to the whole, you have to yeah. love this and you have to love the role you're in. And if you're not, it's going to become just like arduous work that you don't yeah. care about. And that's when you start to fizzle out. Um, Let's actually one thing that you wanted to mention. Uh, you wanted to uh, give a bit of a shout out to a previous oh, yes, guest on the yes. podcast, uh, Taylor Ryan really currently the creative director of the Thai Cats and one of my very close friends. Uh, he said something, and you want yes. to clear the so, air on that. So I succeeded <laughs> him at the Thai Cats. I took his job, okay, after he left, and basically. He said in that in that interview, if you listen to that episode of the podcast, he said that like the content after he left was bad. The insane program was like it didn't have like this. It didn't have like the I can't remember what the term he used was the the sizzle or like I don't the, remember yeah, the spice. Didn't have the, the spice. spice. And I was like, yeah, because like I had three weeks to make the Instagram <laughs> program, so and I wasn't really like a designer, and they knew that they knew I was like a videographer and like you an know. editor, yeah. But it was just yeah, like again. I didn't enjoy working there. It wasn't for me. There are people that it's for. I don't want to just sit here and be like, the Tiger Cats are terrible. Don't work there. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's just, I didn't enjoy working there. But you learned from the there, experience. But I still learned from the experience. You took something away, and I think that's I a good got thing. a lot out of working there, yeah. even though it wasn't my favorite place to work. Yeah, and right? I think no matter what, every place you worked at is a learning experience. Like, I have worked in several different places, and just because due to proximity and due to the time since yeah. I have left those places, um, I'm not going to name names or name companies, but there are places that I did yeah. not enjoy working at, and I was there for a while, but you learn, you also learn what you're willing to put up with. Mm-hmm. And you learn your boundaries as a creative. You learn you learn how to say no in a, in a polite and respectful way to your superiors. You learn a lot in those situations. Um, so moving forward, you found this opportunity in motorsports. You told the Tie Cats you're leaving. Um, how did you end up making working in motorsports as a creative your full time thing? So I started working with AIM Autosport, um, who no longer exist, but they ran the Lexus program at the time and. Uh, Worked for them for 2019, and then the first race of 2020, and then obviously the pandemic happened. So I did a lot of stuff from home. I was also doing like their social and design work as well um, with my limited design skills. Um, but then at the end of 2020, uh, they were like, hey, like we sold the team off. We're not going to do this anymore. I was like, okay, that's fine. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I want to keep doing this. Now, obviously, we, traveling was very tough because in the middle of the pandemic, I got hooked up with another team uh, from Montreal that was like, hey, we want you to shoot for us this year. Uh, we have like a variance from the government, so you can cross the border and everything, and it's fine. I was like, okay, great. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. But it worked out. I made it to every single race in the U.S., and I, I did... I had to quarantine every time I came home, like four, 14 days. During the pan- travel during the pandemic, it was different. It was, it was, it was weird. Like going to the U.S., where like you could go to restaurants and sit and eat, and no one's wearing a mask. Versus here, like, like you can't even go into a grocery store. Which was, and then honestly, it got kind of frustrating near the end. Like by the summer of 2021, when like the U.K. had reopened fully, and like I crossed the border to New York, and it had it had opened fully, and no one was wearing masks anymore because everybody was vaccinated. And like in Canada, you couldn't go to a restaurant. 
like that actually got kind of annoying after a while, but, but eventually it all worked out. I did mm-hmm. that full season for them. And then just word travels fast. I tell people motorsport is like, it's a small, such a small world. If you're good or bad at your job, everyone will know. And you have to be very careful who you talk shit about because everyone knows everyone. So word traveled fast. People just kept coming up to me. We're like, Hey, I'd love you to shoot for me. And I was like, okay, let's talk about it. You know, whatever. So a lot of it, a, a lot of in sports in general is just a lot of word of yeah. mouth. Like I, I, even though I apply like a lot of the opportunities I've gotten in my career, very similar, just by people talking to each other and recommending. So it's, it's great to hear that that also extends into, um, motor sports. Um, moving forward into that, um, most people kind of equate working in motorsports or assuming people working in motorsports, they assume F1. Yeah. Right, they assume. Oh, like you work in motorsports, you must work Formula One. But you, you've shot way more than just that. I don't know if you yeah, shot yeah. F one, but you, you shoot from NASCAR endurance races. You shot mm-hmm. Le Mans. You've shot twenty four hours of Spa. A huge mm-hmm. variety of different yeah, yeah. motorsports. Um, can you talk about? Uh, you wanted to mention something yeah, else yeah, off okay. the start here. So before the Netflix documentary, before Drive to Survive, when I told people I worked in racing, they're like, "Oh, so you shoot NASCAR." That's what uh, they would say, right? And you'd always be like, well, sometimes I do. But now they're like, oh, so you Formula One, so you shoot Formula One. I'm like, no, I don't shoot Formula One. Uh, you actually, like, as a videographer, it's going to come quite as a shock. You can't really film anything in a Formula One race because of, like, TV rights rules. Yeah. So um, it's something I ran into in Australia last year as well when I shot V8 supercars. You can't film anything on track. You can That's film actually very similar drivers to- Drivers climbing in cars. How exciting. It's just not interesting, right? No, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like I'm doing a lot more work right now in like the UFC and the MMA world. I have have a client I'm working with who has a fight here in Toronto and we can't film the fight. Because yep. the UFC holds the holds exactly. the video rights. And I, I think that's a huge misconception when people want to work in sports. Is like you you can go to a F one race or you could go to a UFC, but you might not be able to film. Yeah, and, and people are like, Oh well, I can film from the stands. I had that whole thing in Australia, I had a TikTok go off while I was there, and I'm like, I would have loved to film this championship burnout, but it wasn't allowed. And people are like, Oh, it was in the stands and I filmed, what the hell are you talking about? And I'm like, I wasn't allowed to film it because I'm credentialed media. And if, and, and people yeah. will see it and you will get in trouble if you film it and you're credentialed because you're on a yes. list. Like it's not, it's I'd not. I'd like to come back here one day. Yeah, I, I, I'd like getting money. <laughs> Although I did write an op-ed in uh, in Speed Cafe, which is Australia's number one like motorsport okay. news thing about my experience. And I talked about how stupid the rules were. I'm, and then I had someone tell me earlier this year that like, they know about that, eh? Like oh, you might, yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you might be blacklisted. Sometimes you gotta speak your mind, though. But I know the guy that works there, so it should be okay. But gotcha. yeah, but anyway, like yeah. So you can't film anything in a Formula One race. Now it's not to say there aren't great creatives working in Formula One. Like um, Jimmy works for Aston Martin. Jimmy's great. Makes really good content with what he's allowed to film. Yeah, right? if you look at his to- social media, he never actually films the races. No. He's filming the pre-race, the well, post-race, in, in the pit, that's mm. it. Well, in a way, it's like, what I always tell people too, is like the least interesting thing about my job is filming the race cars, because if you want to watch the race, you can put the race on television. And also, like, it's not like, it's it's very unique. Mm-hmm. Shooting motorsports is very unique from other shooting other sports, because like when you're shooting a football game, there's always action in front of your lens. Mm-hmm. Racing, you're they come around your corner or wherever you are, because I shot, I shot, Indy this year, yep. like Toronto Indy for the first time. And I quickly realized like, oh, you got like five seconds of action every you should, you minute. You should shoot the 24 hours of Lamar because it takes four minutes for them to come back. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of it, it it's so, such a different, it's such a different yeah. kind of shooting. So one of the questions I have for you as someone who does this is like, how do you, what's your process for how you plan to shoot these races considering okay. that you have a small window of like, five seconds when they pat fly by your frame and then you're waiting for another five minutes. Mm. What's that? What's your creative process like when you're out shooting a race and, and you know, in terms of getting the shots you like and making sure you're taking the most out of the opportunity in those very brief windows when the, when the, when the action is happening in front of you. So a lot of it is second nature. Now, when you've been to a racetrack multiple times, you know where you want to go to get the shots you want to get. A lot of it is just planning out what your content's going to look like. So for me, I'm very musically like, like I think about music a lot. So I always put the music first and I'm like, okay, what am I going to build out of this? I'll actually like download the songs. I have the music bed app on my phone. I will listen to the songs like while I'm on the plane and I'll think, okay, I'll visualize to myself. It's like really lame, but I'll sit there and be like, what is this going to look like? Yep. With, with I do the same. Right. So, and then you just plan it out. So when you go to a new racetrack, so let's, for example, like I have a YouTube video, I have a couple of YouTube videos where I've done recaps on events I've done where I talk about my process and why I went and shot certain things at certain times of day in certain spots because of the shots I wanted to get, right? So I went to a new track this past week in Malaysia, Sepang, which a lot of people clowned on because apparently not pronouncing it correctly, but that's the English pronunciation, everyone, okay? (laughs) So I can't pronounce it properly because I don't speak Malay. So anyway, um, and we did a recon 
around the access roads on our scooter to see what it would look like. So you're not like in the middle of a session being like, hmm, I wonder if this will look good because you only have an hour, right? So you recon it. And if you shoot a support series, if you shoot like Porsche Cup, the practice is a half hour. And half that time, like they spend it in the pits, like tinkering with the car. Like Indy cars are the worst for that. They come out for two laps and they're like, gone. You might get seven laps in a practice. You better, you better nail it when they come by. Right. Mm-hmm. So basically you recon it out, you figure out what you want to do. And then you just, again, if I've been to a race track multiple times, it's just second nature. I know exactly where I want to get, or you talk to other people. Like I'll, I'll talk to my buddies, Drew Gibson, Jimmy Price. And I'll be like, Hey, this photo, where did you get that from? And they're like, Oh, I went here and get, I'm like, okay, cool. Cause I'm going to get a shot like that. But sometimes what's good for photo is not good for video. Yeah. Right. Like I followed, I was at Paul Ricard in France this year and I followed Drew's like, I'll take you to the best spot for sunset. It was horrible. We were like a mile from the cars, but he was shooting it on like a 35 getting a super wide of the yeah. sunset. I'm like, this is terrible. For I me. don't even have a lens <laughs> like, that works for this. Yeah. Like, what are we doing here? So yeah, but that's basically how my process will work. It's like planning out what we're going to do and then figure out you know, what shots we're going to get. Um, when it comes to your deliverables that you create for the mm-hmm. teams and the brands, what are they, what do they often want? I think social media and the content that, you know, sports teams want keeps changing over the yep. years. Um, and especially I think for racing, it's such a unique situation. It's not like other sports What are the deliverables like that you're usually delivering to these teams and brands. It's all reels now. It's usually all reels. So vertical stuff, a lot of vertical stuff. Um, we don't like vertical. I hate vertical videos, <laughs> but uh, a lot of it's vertical. I'll still do some like recap films, like some longer pieces for certain brands um, and certain certain drivers and stuff. They're interested in that. Uh, like this guy I work for named Chandler Hall, ever from in, in the UAE before, and like I just did like these longer recap films with him, and he loves them. And so <laughs> there's a guy from Turkey that I work for as well, Sally Yolich. He loves these longer pieces, so I'll shoot those for him. I feel like there's like a really interesting shift right now, going back towards long form in yeah. in most sports, like. Um, even like with what I do right now in like the UFC and even with the NHL, like there's a little small shift going back to long form, which is nice. And it's a little refreshing Mm -hmm. to not be restricted to these 30 to 60 seconds. And I think it's because of the rise of YouTube again. I think because people like I have YouTube premium now and like all I watch is YouTube. Like I canceled my Netflix subscription. Interesting. And and, like, I just watch YouTube videos all day. I love YouTube. Get YouTube premium. Best money I ever spent. You can download videos on your iPad and watch them on the plane. It's amazing. And I just love watching YouTube videos. So I think that's a big part of it, right? There's even BMW. W does a series called embedded. I've never gotten to work on it in my work with them. I've always done the social stuff. So like the verticals and things like that. Is that kind of like a docu series they do? Yeah. It's like five or six minute episodes. They do from like certain races, like mm-hmm. bigger ones. Right. So, but yeah, like I, it's a lot of vertical stuff. Like drivers are a lot of them now are doing like seven, eight second edits just to like a trending audio. And the trending audio thing is kind of cool because you hear the trending audio and you're like, okay, what, can, what can I make to this? Yeah. Right. And you get kind of excited and you can use like licensed music. I don't know how any of that works or how it's legal, but we're all using licensed music for everything through yeah. Instagram now. Right. So but yeah, that's, that's a lot of it now. It's just like the, the licensed stuff. No, that's awesome. Um, one thing I want to talk about is the variety of races that you cover. We talked about NASCAR. We talked about endurance races. We talked about, you mentioned so many different things. Uh, how does your creative mindset change from kind of race to race, depending on the style of, of car that you're shooting or um, even like this, the, you know, something from like NASCAR or IndyCar yeah. and then going to shoot 24 hour, a 24 hour race. What changes in your creative mindset and in your prep for one of those races compared to something else? So every race is different, right? You have to think of them in how the storytelling is going to be based on the event. So when you're doing a 24 hour race, the story is going to be very different. We have to talk about how this is a very difficult event. It's a tough slog. There's multiple drivers sharing the car. The crew is tired. We're in a nighttime. It's a grind. That's a story. There's sunrise or sunset, right? It's very different. It's a huge story. When you're doing a shorter race, like a Porsche cup race, you're doing an IndyCar car race. Like it's, it's obviously much more action packed. It's quick. It's a shorter event, right? So you really have to think about the story that you want to tell. So for me, I'm, I'm actually like in a position now where a lot of the time I feel like I make the same video every time. And then I want to stop doing that. Right. I want to like start thinking about different ways of making stuff. And I've like retired a few, I've decided at the end of this year, a couple of my things that I do are being retired because I do them for every video. Like what? Like give us so an example. Photo effect um, where I'll like shoot at a, a very slow frame rate, like three frames a second. And then I'll play it back And I'll add like a photo frame to it. So it looks like someone is taking photos of the car as it goes by. And then I'll usually film a photographer for a second and then cut to the photos. I've done that like six times this year. Need to stop doing that. They kind of, they kind of become crutches. It's cool, but you do it for every video. And it's like, but you got, you got to remember your audience doesn't see all your videos, but like I see them. It bothers me. I feel that. I feel that. Right. Or like I I decided a while ago I was going to do less slow-mo because it just becomes a crutch. You're just shooting slow-mo race cars. Right. It's certain 
things can be slow mo. If it's a bumpy racetrack and you want to we show, we talked the about car, this before the podcast. Right? Like, not everything has to be shot at no. 120 frames slow no. motion. Like, shoot 24, shoot 60. Because it's a lot of 24. It also just gives it a different look and gives it gives. It's more refreshing for me for yeah. the eye. Like when I see when I see edits and I'm like, oh, that was shot in 24. Like they didn't have to slow that down. Like that looks really. Lack of, I hate using cinematic, but yep. it looks it looks way better. So I think that's uh, I, I think keeping it fresh is something that I actually haven't been able to talk about much on the podcast or in the channel. Is just kind of creatively keeping it new and reinvigorating versus doing the same thing. And mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that you're not leaning on your crutches and you're actually retiring certain aspects of your like skills. It's good to be self-aware. Like, yeah. Watch your stuff. Me thinking that like, now I'm retiring a few things. Watch going your to stuff and be like, Oh, I do that a lot. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, when it goes back to sort of the storytelling, um, what I try to do a lot is, is tell the story off the racetrack because like race cars are cool. But I kind of said this earlier, if you want to see what happened in the race, watch the race. Show people stuff that they can't see on TV, right? So we do a lot of like scenics now, like going out beforehand and like shooting around town, shooting a various, you know, things in the area that are specific to that area. Like when I was in Bahrain, I went to shoot that, I can't remember what it's called, the, the mosque that's in the middle of Manama that's like really famous. I went and filmed some of that and I incorporated that into my videos, right? A lot of, don't try to do, don't do a lot of drone stuff because you can't fly drones at racetracks usually. Like you can, but. Bending rolls a little it, bit. It depends, right? I see. <laughs> right, it depends, yeah, depends. They're usually close to race, uh, to airports, so it's yeah. usually tough, right? So, but yeah, just shoot, doing some of that, like in Kuala Lumpur, like I went into like, we shot the Petronas Tower and went to Batu Caves and shots and stuff. Didn't end up using any of it, but I'm glad that we had it if we wanted to incorporate that. Mm -hmm. Just to like, because when you're shooting an international racing series, for example, you want to show people that it's international. Like this is a big deal. Like when you shoot IMSA in the US, it's cool. It's awesome. It's the same cars as the World Endurance Championship. But the World Endurance Championship feels so much more awesome because you're like, this is international. This feels like it's huge. like in some random, a different yeah. race in every country, right? Like, and you want to show people things from that country. So if there's a race in Brazil next year, well, obviously I'm going to get drone footage of like the Statue of Christ and probably incorporate that, right? So we're in Brazil, right? You yeah, know, so you, you want to show where you're at, and I think that exactly. adds the allure of like the the story of the race and showing people that mm -hmm. things they normally wouldn't see. What's your favorite style of race to shoot these days? Is it the shorter races? Is it the longer races? Endurance races, yeah, yeah for sure. Like I. Think I think most of what I do now is sports car racing. Now there's a lot of different sports car championships. I've shot five or six different championships this year. And it's, and it's the funny thing is like, it's a lot of the same cars, like in different championships. So mm -hmm. Sports car racing, it's so confusing so fast. Like I can, exp the reason F1 is so popular is I can explain F1, the basis of F1 to you in three minutes. Go for it. Okay, there's 20 cars. There's 10 teams, there's two cars per team, okay? Uh, the race is like 65 laps. They have three types of tires. They have to use both sets two of the three in a race because they had to make at least one pit stop and change the tires to a different kind. Okay. Uh, there's a thing called DRS where your wing opens and you get faster. It opens up after three laps. That's formula one. I just explained formula one to you. You can follow it and watch it. I need three hours and a PowerPoint presentation to explain the world endurance championship to you. Cause it's so confusing. Mm. There's so many rules. There's like drive time rules. It's pretty intimidating. It's multiple that. drivers. First off, so you have to explain to people, no one guy does not drive for 24 hours. They switch. Okay. I was going to say that would but be then hell. This guy has to do a minimum amount of drive time and this guy can't do this much but he can only do this much in a six hour period it gets super confusing but the people that love it love it it's right? a very niche thing but i Incredibly can tell how you can niche. get really yeah. dialed into it for sure exactly and and the great thing about it is there's so much manufacturer involvement because what people don't understand manufacturers compete in motorsports that comes out of their marketing budget it's to sell cars. That's why they. That's why Ferrari races in Formula One. It's to sell Ferraris, right? It's not because they want to win stuff in Formula One. The 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 end game is to sell people Ferraris, or or at least Ferrari jackets and the Ferrari lifestyle. Merch, yeah, right. So same thing in racing. Like, and manufacturers also use racing to develop things for their road cars. That's why the twenty four hours of Le Mans began. It was manufacturers wanted to show their car could run for twenty four hours straight. Right? That's insane. I had no yeah, idea. And that's why that race exists and wow. still going on to this day, right? And now we've got the most manufacturer involvement we've ever had. It's insane. Like we're we're in very it's a very good time to be doing what I do right now. And I'm running myself ragged because this might not last more than a couple of years and we might go into another slump, right? With a lot of manufacturers leave and things change. Right, like privateer racing will always be part of it, but the manufacturers are where the money is at for us to make hmm. because they're they they're much more likely to just you send them a quote, they're like, Yeah, no problem. You know, because yeah. it's just money to them. It's a drop in the bucket compared to what it is to like a privateer race team. So sports car racing, that's what I'm doing mostly now. And that's a big reason. I did some Indy car last year as well, um, for just for a driver uh, from Toronto, Dalton Kellett. He's now since retired. He just uh, he works at the family company here in Toronto. So 
Uh, and that was really cool because I got to shoot the Indy 500, which is like, I've been very fortunate over the That's last like few years. That's like an iconic years. race. I've done most of the big ones in the world. I've been very fortunate the last few years to do those. So I did the, I've done the Indy 500, the Daytona 500. I've done like Le Mans 24, Spot 24 a couple times. Um, I've done Daytona 24. How many times now? Six, five, a bunch of times. Since 2019, I haven't missed one. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been cool. But I prefer sports car racing because there's just so much more story to tell. You've got multiple drivers. Like the pit stops are more interesting. You've got... 24 hour racing. You've got, you know, we're going to race through sunset. We're going to race at nighttime. Then we're going to race through sunrise. And we have so much storytelling that there is to, to show. Right. And that's what I love about it. And there's even shorter races There's two hours and 40 minute races. Like we have an IMSA, we have a six hour race, we have an eight hour race, a 12 hour race. And a lot of the racetracks you go to are, there's just history. They're iconic. And it's just, it's just awesome. You know, it's just, it's so, you know, it's never, it's never the same story. You're no, exactly. always getting variety. And I could never do a series like NASCAR. They do 38 races a year and 20, 31 of them are on ovals. Now, oval tracks are cool. I've shot a few oval tracks. I've shot some NASCAR. I've done Texas. I've done the Daytona 500. I've done Michigan. I did some ovals in IndyCar. I did Iowa. So I've done some oval stuff. It's just not that interesting. I was going to say, it's just driving. I hate being that guy. Okay, so, like, so, so let's talk that about guy. that. So people love to say, oh, IndyCar, they just turn left. First of all, IndyCar has 17 races a year, and 12 of them are on road courses, okay? So they do five oval races a year. The Indy 500 is unlike anything you'll ever experience in your life. It is insane. It is just like, there's 400,000 people at the event, 30,000 of which are having an EDM festival inside of turn three and don't even know the race is happening because they're, you know, high on whatever they're high on and drunk as hell and they're enjoying <laughs> their EDM festival called the snake pit. Okay. And it's insane. Like it's 200 laps of just cars going 238 miles an hour. You have not experienced, you don't even know what it's like to experience. You stand outside of turn three when 33 cars come by in a pack going 238 miles an hour. It's absolutely insane. It's there's nothing like. I it. mean, I think that's a it's that's just so cool. Here compared to like F1 these days, where like yeah. we know what's going to happen every goddamn race, exactly. And you don't need to. You don't need to be. You you can. You don't have to be smart to know what, who's going to yeah. win and who's going to. And it's nice to hear that there is that change in other in other race types, yep. and that there is like an, a still an exhilarating factor, even though it might be an oval sometimes. But like, yeah. I think that's just people clowning to clown. Exactly, and and the thing that really makes Indy 500 great is the qualifying. So it's the coolest qualifying format in the world. Everybody does four laps, ten miles is two and a half mile track average mile per hour over your four laps. You have to run four completely perfect laps to get the pole at Indianapolis. And the qualifying is better than the race, honestly. Like if you go for the qualifying weekend, the weekend before, if there's more than 33 cars, so 33 cars start the race, usually they'll have more than that. So people miss the race. So they get bumped out. And that's like the most stressful and insane like thing you've ever witnessed. It's crazy. Cutthroat. It's crazy. And then they do the pole shootout, like 12 cars go for the pole. And that's like wild. But then they like the race starts and they all go off turn four and they're all messed up and it's like whatever. But yeah. still, it's it's a really cool experience. I'm glad I've got to do that one. If it's the only one I ever do, it's fine. It'd be cool to do it again. But sports car racing is now like what I love because the cars, the GT cars, they look like road cars. They have that road car relevance. We also have like state of the art prototype race cars that are like hybrid powered, mm -hmm. like cars that launch out of the pit lane under hybrid and then fire up as they drive. It's Un, it's insane. You can see some of the videos on my TikTok, especially of the Cadillac. It just sounds unbelievable. And you're just around this crazy technology. Some of the best race car drivers in the world that people are like, oh, they're not an F1, so they're not the best in the world. No, nah, there are guys that you don't even know about that just didn't have the money or, or you know, connections to make it to Formula One or Formula One just didn't suit them. So now they're doing sports car racing. Like one of my clients, Kamui Kobayashi, he races in sports cars. I'd still think that if you put him in Verstappen's car, he'd win the world championship. So it's, it's an amazing type of racing to work in. It's crazy. You just talked about, you kind of gave us the insight just now on all the different kinds of racing and why you are so passionate about it. One thing in particular that I think is really unique about your creative kind of career and what you're doing as of right now is shooting those 24 hour endurance races. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people aren't really familiar with them, myself included. Okay. Um, but from what I understand is they are literally racing for an entire day, multiple drivers. Nice. Um, Apart from the actual, you know, racing that happens that day, you as someone who's covering that event, I've never heard of a creative individual having to cover an event that goes on for a full day. Um, give us a little bit of insight on what it's like to cover a 24 hour race or a 12 hour race. Okay. So let's talk about 24s first. So a 24 hour race I've done, I think in total, I've done nine of them. I did four this year. And then before that, I think I did 19, 20, 21, 22. Five. Yeah, so I've done nine in total. Five Daytonas, two spas, Le Mans once, and I did the 24 hours of Dubai as well. So they're all different because 
you know, they're different championships. So Daytona, for example, we'll start with Daytona. So Daytona is the easiest one. Daytona 24 is all contained inside Daytona International Speedway, the road course configuration. A lot of it uses the oval, but then there's like an infield portion that they go through. It's the easiest one because you can, the track's fairly walkable. It's a long way to walk. The track is two, two and a half miles long. So it's a, mm -hmm. but the cars come by you like 650 times because it's a very short lap. It's only three and a half miles in total. So that one's not that hard. You have testing weekend the weekend before. So you're, you're in Daytona for 10 days because you're going to shoot the testing. And then you've got practice. The worst, honestly, the worst part of 24 is just the week leading up to it. The race is easy compared to like Thursday at Daytona is one of the hardest days of the year because you've got practice at 9 a.m., practice at 2 p.m., then practice at 7 p.m. until 9. You have to deliver stuff. It's a whole like full 16, 17 hour day. And then you still have to work the 24 on the weekend. So you're there. It's a whole week event. That's what people don't understand. It's like, I don't just show up Saturday morning Be two like, hours hey, before the race starts. Yeah. Hey, what's up? No, I have to show up. I have to shoot practice and deliver content every day, shoot interviews, all that kind of stuff leading up and then do the race. So Daytona is the easiest one just because of how small the track is. Now, Dubai was fairly easy because I only had one client. It was a specialty client. These guys from Australia, they hired me to do it. They wanted me to like make like a film for them. I had a lot of fun doing it. It's not the best racetrack in the world. It's a long way to travel to go to Dubai. Uh, it's just, it's a really boring track in terms of the sunsets there are unbelievable. It's one of the best sunsets in the world. However, the track's not great to shoot. And, but it was fine. I had one client, so it was, it was not bad. That's yeah. the earliest I've ever left at 24. It ended at three and I was out of the media center and gone by 4.30. So I had the edit like ready to just add the celebration footage and add it, boom, gone and left. So, so what's your process there when you're shooting? The, like the actual, like you, what, like you, you mentioned you had yep. the edit pretty much done except for the celebration. Are you, are you, as you're shooting the race, running back, editing through yes. the day? So yeah, like. Let, let's. This is a bit of an ass, but let's go from hour zero okay, to right. hour twenty four. Okay, so let's. Do How it. do you do this? All right. So let's let's do for example, um, if I take you through uh, like the spa twenty four this year. So let's, let's take go you, with that. Let's take you through that one. Okay. So that one, unfortunately, that morning in a support race, a driver was killed. So this year, yes. Oh my in gosh! One of the F three races or F four races, uh, open wheel event, a driver was killed. So that kind of put a damper on the whole thing. Um, it was raining, it was bad weather. Um, so by the time our race started, uh, we thought it might get canceled. We might not run because a driver was killed. Um, and we went ahead with it. They just didn't do any celebration at the beginning. They didn't do any fireworks, or anything like that. They didn't sing the national anthem. They didn't just went straight to the race. Started under safety car. So we Lovely. started under safety car because of the weather conditions. So it was raining. Uh, we did an hour of safety car before the race started. So the clock starts, but we're just under safety car. So we're running around single file. And then somebody crashed at the top of Eau Rouge under safety car. So that added some more time to that. And I was standing in the grandstands. And if you know anything about the grandstands of Spa uh, and Europe in general, uh, smoking, very popular over there, <laughs> you're allowed to smoke in the grandstands, which is something you is unfathomable here, but... No one would show up if you couldn't smoke in the grandstands at Spa. So I was dying of smoke inhalation for an hour and a half waiting to shoot the start, which ended up being super lame. Basically, I worked myself around a good portion of the circuit. I walked up the Camel Straight. I shot for about two and a half hours, and then I made my way back. I had my I rented a scooter. I rented a Vespa because I did it the year before, walking, never again. So I rented a Vespa, rode it around, came back, did some editing. I delivered a little bit of stuff, just some single clips, like, People want short clips like in a vertical format for like their Instagram story. So I delivered some clips that it was like, do, do a stint in the pit lane. Okay, we're going to get sunset. Okay, no, we're not because it's cloudy. So we're not going to get a sunset. So that actually made things a lot easier. So you're not, you're not just, sorry to cut you off. You're not just shooting the rate. I mean, it doesn't make sense to shoot the same thing for 24 straight no. hours. It's, it's, and I've already shot four days of practice. Yeah. So you have so, enough <laughs> content. So you're, yeah. you're taking a break to edit midway through a race. So it's not just like, I, I spend half the race probably editing because okay. I already shot everything or I prioritize the pit lane because you want to get the driver changes because sometimes during practice, they don't do like full pit stops. Mm -hmm. They don't do like you know full especially in the u.s like in imsa they're not wearing like the crew won't be wearing suits or anything or helmets they're like shorts and a t-shirt like i can't use that for like race footage so you just prioritize pit lane then i had one of my clients break down four hours in didn't couldn't finish the race couldn't get the car back because it got stranded like trackside they just pulled it in and they're like can't get it back till tomorrow so they were out of the race so i was down on clients already and basically it was just edit, go back out, edit. I did some night shooting. I tried to shoot a day to night transition, which took like so many hours of getting at spa. The, 
Spa is the most overrated racetrack in the world. Interesting. People love Spa. They're like, oh, it's the best. No, you don't. You love Eau Rouge. You love that one corner. Outside of that, it's the most boring. Like, it's just not interesting. One of the coolest clips I've ever seen on your TikTok was that, you want to see something cool? Look at this. And yeah. you're in Eau Rouge. That's at the bottom of Eau Rouge, right? And that's all it is. Like, people, all these creators, these European videographers, they milk Spa for views. They're like, oh, best corner in the world. Yeah, it's cool. Nowhere else on that track is interesting. So... I get it, but like you're you're in like Lake Home, you're out at like Dubla Gauche, not interesting at all. Like you're like whatever, and it's not recognizable. People only recognize Eau Rouge. Yeah. So, and you can't when the, when it's dark there, it's dark. You cannot see what car is coming. You so what ends up happening is you have to listen for your car, which sounds crazy. Interesting. So all the cars have a different engine. So there's though. no lights on the track barely any it's just headlights on the cars and by the time it's on top of you you it's gone it's gone so you basically or you just shoot every car basically <laughs> you spray and pray sometimes but a lot of time i'll listen so like if i'm like okay i'm shooting a porsche i know what the porsche sounds like when it goes by right it sounds different than an amg it sounds different than an aston martin but to sometimes no, there's to normal people that sounds insane exactly but as someone who watches motorsports that's incredible so there's like but there's also sometimes there's like 14 porsches so like, is it mine? So one thing you can do is set a stopwatch. So you can set a stopwatch, you have an Apple watch or I do it on my phone. So the lap is two minutes and seven seconds. So I'm going to set a stopwatch for two minutes and then think to myself, okay, count it down one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Hopefully my car will come by. And then it doesn't. You're like, did it crash? Is it in the pits? <laughs> Unless you're wearing a radio, you don't know. Yeah. Right. So, so it's hard. Like there's so many nuances. That is so incredible. That's why Daytona is easy. Daytona is lit. You can tell where, like, what cars are coming, right? So, uh, but Spa is insane. Spa is so hard. I think, I think Spa is the worst one. Like, Le Mans is really difficult too, but Spa, I think, is like, what makes Le Mans so difficult. It's the whole week leading up and all the red tape. It's like, I, I don't want to get blacklisted, so like, I won't go into it. But like, it's just a lot of it is really annoying. Okay, fair enough. It's like rules for the sake of rules type stuff. It's, it's, it, but, and it's just a difficult event. The track is, it's a good, uh, how long is the track? 13 kilometers. So it's huge. And literally like Le Mans is a fever dream. So I'm sorry, I should probably finish talking about spa first. Yeah. So I, you're back and forth, you're doing your pit stops by the time the sunrise is, ha is over, which this year we didn't get one because it was cloudy, which end is honestly, it's like, Oh great. I don't have to worry about shooting the sunrise. I'll just yeah. stay in the media center. Uh, we got some rain on and off and then actually the client win the race in their class. So it was like, go down to the, get the celebration at the pit wall. That is nerve wracking because I have to get, I have one chance to get this. I wanted to get the car coming by. And they all go to the wall, right? Yeah. And like, and like and they jump on and cheer. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, gotta get the car going by and then pan over. And I did shoot the whole thing in slow mo, so I could, you know, have it like I try. I, celebrations look better in slow mo. Right? Yeah, and you can just stretch it, just those speed out. it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah. you go down to the podium, which is like on the other side of the planet. They do it on the other side of the it's the most annoying podium in the world. They do it like on the other side of like the the second front stretch, like the mm -hmm. old front stretch. And you have to get down there and it's like a big stage set up. And they actually had like a DJ playing there like all night, which is kind of cool. But yeah. And then you shoot that and then it's like, Hey, I gotta go back and edit something. And granted, like I just had to do like one vertical reel for my client who was the driver. And he's like, I want you to use like this music. And it was, uh, Oh no. Uh, which song was it? It was a Snoop Dogg song. It was sick. So we did like a, an edit from the 24, like the Snoop Dogg song, which That's was amazing. Like, and then we were done. And then we went for pizza. And uh, then you go to sleep for a day. Yeah. And then was all said and done. I was awake for like that one, like 36 to 37 hours. It's not my record. My record's 38 and a half. Like straight stingling. Straight stingling. So that's my next question. Now that we went through the whole one hour to hour, tw as your yeah, hour, yeah, yeah. Is, is hour 24, how do you stay like dialed in and awake during 24 hours? Like obviously like I, I, being in sports, like yep. long hours, we're used to it. You know, I work in hockey. I work at night. Like I know yeah. how it is, but staying awake for 24 hours and shooting for 24 hours is a mental marathon and a physical yeah. marathon. Like what do you do throughout the day to stay awake and in the zone? You just do. That's the crazy thing. Like I will never, I won't do it anymore. I'm going to start having naps during it because like I've gotten to a point where like my body's just been destroyed after these races and it's like, it's not worth it. But when you're working alone, which I am a lot of the time, it's like, I don't know. I can't risk missing something. What if my client crashes? What if this happens? You know what I mean? What if like a, a major part of the story of this video we're making, I miss because they crashed and they had to fix it for three hours and I was asleep. So, you know, like I don't want to miss that, but now I'm like, I'm going to start working as a, as part of a team for these things or just telling my client like, Hey, 
I, I realized at Lamar this year that after the sunrise was over and I had shot sunrise and all that, that I could have just gone to sleep for like five hours and it would have been fine. Cause the race goes from 4 PM till 4 PM. Well, sunrise is 7 AM by the time the, the crazy thing with the race, by the time the sun comes up, you still have eight hours left. And you're like, Jesus, I could have just gone to sleep for like four or five hours and been fine. And that's what most people do at that one. So I'm going to start doing that. I'm not going to stay up for these whole things anymore because it's too much. It just kills you. But what I usually do is like, I'm falling asleep while I'm editing. Go shoot. I'll just go shoot. Uh, that'll keep me awake. Just go for a walk. You, you hit a second wind about 930 in the morning where you feel invincible. You literally have this feeling where you're like, I don't think I'll ever sleep again. <laughs> you're just walking around. You're like, I didn't go to How sleep. How good is that for a sleep you're like, once you're I, done? You're like, I didn't go to sleep last night. I might, I, I feel fine. I could just, now I know I could just not sleep. And like the key, the, the, I, the key is like brush your teeth, follow your normal routine as you normally would. So brush your teeth at like 10 o'clock at night, brush your teeth in the morning. Uh, if you can get a shower during Trick one, your mind a little bit. Yeah. If you can get your, a shower during one, it's game changer, right? That'll wake you up. That'll wake you up. Right. So cold gotta, shower. No, just regular. Shower. Okay, trick, trick your mind a little bit. Right. So, and yeah, and I don't do any caffeine. No mm -hmm. caffeine. Drink lots of water and hydrate. Interesting. So I thought like Red Bulls, makes coffee you crash would be... Okay. And eat healthy. Try not... To, it's really easy to be like, I'm just going to eat a bag of Oreos because I can eat whatever I want because I'm going to be awake for 38 hours. But it's like, that will just kill you, right? So having um, a team, if you're working for a team and they have like a catering pass, that's key because then you can eat real food. But usually you're just eating like... Snacks. Granola bars, Cliff bars. I live off Cliff bars. Like when I'm on the road, but yeah. So that's, that's how you do it. You just do it. You know, Damn, that's it's stupid. It's dumb. It's really stupid. Like I made a TikTok video once, but like, yeah, I've never slept during one of these. It was like, for like 38 and a half hours. And someone commented, they're like, that's really bad for your body. And I was like, yeah, I know. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not shit. saying do it. Like I'm just saying, I'm yeah, doing it. I'm an so idiot. you don't have to. Yeah. So oh, yeah, I actually, hilarious. if you want to see what one's like, I did vlog the Dubai 24 and it's on my YouTube channel. I will link his YouTube yeah, channel so in the can, description you can below watch for the it. vlog for the Dubai 24, which was the easiest 24 I've ever worked. Cause I made one client. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Like, that's yeah. it's the feat of endurance and the fact that you're able to do that for 24 hours. It's definitely not good for your body, but mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly impressive because, like, people bitch and moan about, oh, I have to work seven hours. It's a game night for whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. NFL or whatever team you work for. And I'm like, okay, but like, guys out here shooting 24 hours of a race. It's not a contest, though. No, it's no, not, it's not. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's a, it's a right? different beast. It's for sure. It's a different beast entirely. Um, What's the uh, shifting gears here really quickly from the 24 hour race? Um, what's your gear setup? What do you what do you use when you're shooting motorsports? Um, you know, I'm not super familiar with the motorsports. Okay. Like, like I've never I've rarely shot motorsports. So I'm not sure. But what's the gear set you use? Camera lenses? What's that? The whole uh, setup you have for that? Sure. So the going usually in racing, most people are shooting Sony. So especially in Europe, it's pretty much, there's a couple like outliers that are shooting like Canon, like a C70, but most people are shooting on Sony. A lot of it is people shooting mirrorless. So a7S3, a lot of FX3. Um, Why do you think that is? Vertical video. That's really the only reason is vertical video. Um, there's so much vertical now. There's like whole crews that just shoot vertical. So uh, a lot of it's vertical. So that's why. Um, and a lot of like the creators are younger, 21, 22, especially in Europe. So we call them like the gimbal kids. <laughs> so they'll always have a, they'll always have a gimbal the and like gimbal an FX3 kid. and like one lens. And like they almost never go trackside. They just shoot in the pit lane and they make like social stuff, which is not my style, but they're very good at what they do. They make like those like flip transition videos that are really cool and get lots of views. Right. It's a different style. They crush at that. They're so good at it. And they're like, I only hate on it because I'm not as good as them. <laughs> right? Gimbal kids. Yeah. So we joke about it, right? So like they never leave. They'll have a 24 hour race at Nürburgring and they'll never leave the pit lane. It's like one of the coolest racetracks in the world. But anyway, so uh, so I shoot FX6. I bought one this year in the summer and I will never go back to shooting on mirrorless because it just changed my life. It's got ND filters built into the body. Cannot beat that. And if you shoot cars, you need to have a polarizer, and it's, it gets really annoying stacking a polarizer on top of an. ND. Oh no, I would not. You want end to. up having to use a, a fixed ND, and you're like, oh, it's brighter today. I have to switch my fixed ND and then put my polarizer on. No, I just push a button on my camera, and <laughs> it even has an auto mode, which I've never used because I don't trust it. But yeah. you can just like boom, done. Never use auto. And the other thing with the script with the Sony is just the dual base ISO. So if you're shooting at night, 12,800, boom, done. And you're just like filming with no grain, which is crazy, especially at a track like Spa where it's so dark. Uh, so that's a huge part of it. Um, in terms of lenses, um, I'm big Sigma guys. So I have a lot of Sigmas. Uh, they're 97% the same lens as the manufacturer ones, and they cost half the money. So... Mm -hmm. 
when I, when I switched to Sony and I talked to the rep, I said, I'm sorry, I can't buy your lens because it's just, it doesn't make sense. And he's mm-hmm. like, I get it. So I have 24 to 70, you have 2.8. Uh, my favorite lens right, going right now is a 50 millimeter 1.4. Sigma, unbelievable. Like I, she's so using a prime for shoes. So I used to be so anti prime, and then I got my first prime, and it's just like this is way better. I've been I've been on the prime train recently yeah. to shoot source, and yeah. I like don't get me wrong, I love rocking a seventy two hundred. Yeah. I love rocking a twenty four seventy, but like when you do this shit all the time, you want to change it up. You have to do something to make it interesting, and it makes you think out of the box. Exactly. I, I'm shooting a documentary for that for a UFC fighter right now. I had a UFC two ninety seven. And the last two, the last practice I shot, exclusively shot in a 55. Yeah. And it just makes you think so differently on how to capture things and mm-hmm. positioning yourself. But for racing, it's so unique because you're right at the, you're, you can be track side most, some of the time. Um, what, what, is it just to keep you, your like creative creativity fresh that you're using exactly. the primer? Is it for like, so the, mostly for pit lane, I'll use like a 50 and then sometimes I'll take a 50 track side if I want to get some wides. So usually it's for pit lane. I just find that. I can also get down to 1.4 at night, which is like insane. Like why would you shoot sports at 1.4? But if you're shooting like close-ups and stuff, it it looks pretty nice. And yeah, it just forces you to like use your legs and move and to get a different shot, which I like. Because 24 to 70, you can get lazy. You're just like, oh, I'll just like, you know, zoom (laughs) in, I'll zoom out, right? But so it's just something different. Um, Then I use for for telephoto, I have a 100 to 400, like the F4.5 to 5.6. Do you think, do you find, sorry to interrupt you, do you find the uh, aperture change annoying? No, I just keep it at 5.6. So when you're shooting race cars, like I'm, you're at 400 millimeter. Do you need to be at F1? Like, no, like okay. when, I'm, when I'm shooting 24 in broad daylight, I'm shooting at like F8. It's a car zooming past me. Like, does you want to really make sure all of it's in focus. The field there yeah. is, right? No, it's no. different. It's very Especially when you're shooting manual focus through a fence. So there's so many people. That's my biggest pet peeve now. There's so many kids all the time. They ask me about autofocus. Like, oh, I want to get this camera autofocus. Oh, this lens autofocus. All this. Like, learn how to manual focus a lens and how to see focus. Because there are days where your manual. I feel called out here. I use I use autofocus. Might, I feel- I, yeah, I use it a lot. Seventy thirty probably autofocus now. Before I shot Sony and didn't have autofocus, I don't know how I lived. Right, but it's just. Learn. It's important to know. Because it, what if it's pouring rain and your auto your, your your autofocus mechanism stops working or your lens breaks and you're in the middle of an event in Dubai? You can go to your client and be like, sorry, everything's not sharp. I don't know how to focus. And they're like, what the hell are we paying you for? Right? Like that's the thing is you have to learn those skills because there's a day when you're going to shoot through a fence at 85 millimeter and you cannot focus on the car. It's going to focus on the fence. You have to manual focus it. Right? So... But yeah, I usually shoot a higher F stop because the cars makes are, it easier to focus too. One hundred percent, just don't work smart, not hard. Yep. You know, not everything has to be you know super cinematic. Like we're not we're not you know Stanley Kubrick. We're not shooting at f point eight five. You know, like we're just let's just film the car come by. Then I have a seventy to two hundred as well, um, which is like f two point eight for night shooting. I've also recently started using that with a teleconverter rather than taking the one to four, having more versatility with a 70 to two. So if I want to use it at night or for like, if I want to put it on a gimbal for like interesting, like long lens gimbal shots or doing scenics, and then I can just put the teleconverter on and boom, I've got 400. It's at five, six. It's exactly the same. It's not quite as sharp and the focus definitely changes to it's a lot more sensitive, but for video, it's fine. For photos, you'd never be able to get away with it. I've never thought about using a teleconverter. It's amazing. It's 600 bucks and you've got a 400 now. That's what, I, that's what I'm going to start telling people to do. And, but can you use autofocus with it or is it yep. main? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Which so one do you have? The Sony one. Two, two times. Two so times. it doubles your, doubles your aperture as well. It doubles oh. your focal length. So it's 5.6 instead of 2.8. I used it all weekend in Malaysia. I used it at Spot 24. It was fine. But a lot of the time when I'm going to tracks in Europe, I'll just take the one to four if we're not if we're not doing nice shooting because you're they're F1 spec tracks, you're farther away. F1 spec tracks are much harder to shoot because there's so much paved runoff. They're like parking lots, a lot of them, while the American circuits are like insane. They're so much better to shoot. You're like right on top of the cars, there's grass, like it just looks so much cooler. But in terms of the rest of my gear, what else do I use? You have, a, you have a mirrorless camera as well, not just the Yeah, FX. so I have an A7S three that I use on my gimbal, mm-hmm. and I still use that if I'm doing vertical stuff. So I have one client that's like wants everything vertical. It's I'll easy, s- easier than the FX6. Exactly. And I've shot FX6 in vertical a little bit. The problem is it doesn't it doesn't know it's shooting in vertical. So you have to everything put sideways. In post, yes. Which is yes, so yes, annoying yes, when yes, you're pulling yes, selection. Yes. Like, uh, and you're like, oh, I have to <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. So but it's but it's it's a great camera. It's the same sensor essentially. It's exactly the same. It's a great camera. I'm not and I'm like I'm not shooting on mirrorless cameras. They're, no, 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 they're no. fantastic. I use them all the time. Uh, we we talked about it before this podcast. Yeah. We talked about with, with Peter. It's like the reason yeah. I think guys like me and him won't use it at uh, getting FX6 is because you can't get audio at 120. Mm-hmm. But in your situation, 
you're not, you don't need the audio half the time when you're shooting 120. Yeah. So it makes sense for you. And I think it's a bit like people, especially younger people, like, like they think they have to have that camera because it's like, it's the best image. I'm like, no, you get, you got to get what, what is exactly. going to get the job done for you. So I love the fact that you're open about using a mirrorless camera because it, it use, it's more effective for the purposes that your client wants. Right. And that's the thing. It's just having the right gear for the job. Like that's yes, what's important. Right? Exactly. It's not like, so there's a lot of, a lot of like overkill I see at the racetrack a lot of time. And there's a lot of all the gear, no idea. I see that a lot. Like what, a okay. Lot. Okay. So there's a lot of like team, like, production companies will show up with like seven guys to shoot for like a sponsor and they're all on red. They've got a slider track side and it's like, guys, like, what are you doing? Like you mentioned why so you were going to talk about why you didn't, you haven't switched to so a I, true I cinema camera. Almost looked at doing a Komodo at the red. Now the Komodo has kind of become a meme as it's like the red people buy to say they have a red because it's affordable. It's almost about the same price as an FX six until you just to get the brain. Once well, yeah, you, you, gotta, you use gotta it, build that thing you're out looking and at like it. 12, 15 grand Canadian. So it's like decent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Problem is if I'm going to shoot in pro res raw, I'm going to have to buy a lot tens of, storage. of thousands of dollars worth of storage a year. People forget storage costs money. Yeah. And people are like, Oh, just like, uh, Oh, I'm going to build like a NAS. I've got enough space for like, you know, 400 or like, uh, like 12 terabytes. I'm like, I've shot like 47 terabytes this year. Like, that's like a 24 hour race is one hard drive. That's insanity. Like, that's so ridiculous. like that's, it's, and that's, and that's shooting like MP4s, right? Like I'm shooting an intro, like the highest quality, but still like, you're not shooting raw. Imagine that. No, I like, can't you, imagine. You, I don't need to. My stuff's being viewed on a phone and people don't, people forget that. Like, and there's this stuff is, I can show you that like Adam Dismore's done. He's like one of the best motorsports videographers in the world. The guy shoots on Sony. He shot on the FS seven until like earlier this year when I think he got, stolen. I know so many people who still shoot on the yeah, FS seven like, and that thing still kicks. And I that think. thing looks like, like, uh, Christopher Nolan made his movie. Movies, you know, like it's crazy. So it's just, it's all about knowing your gear and how to use it. But yeah, and I the see, right situations to use it in. But I, and I know people that like, there are people who are making a living by, like owning an RE and stuff like that because like, and they just use that to get gigs. They're like, get my gear on your project because mm -hmm. right? I have a 35, yeah. I come with a $35,000 camera. And that just doesn't interest me. That's just not what I'm about. And it doesn't make sense for traveling. Like I travel, man. Like I can't like take huge amounts of equipment with me. I'm not taking five flight cases. I'm taking one roller bag. Right. And then my tripod's in my suitcase. So like, that's, that's all I take with me. And it's, it's perfect for what think I think smarter, not harder. Exactly. And then on top of I'm trying to think what the other like little nuanced pieces of gear I have. So I have a couple specialty lenses as well. I have, uh, everyone's secret. I made this, my, my YouTube video that comes out today. I talked about this. It's everyone's secret lens that everyone has. It's the 55 Helios. Yes. Okay. So it's I don't one, have one yet, yeah, but my, my, 44 my business two. partner has one. Kyle. It's a, and it's a 58, 58. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Everyone has, everyone's like, Oh, it's my secret lens. Everybody has one. Everyone knows about it. And but mine's been modified. So it's a cheater anamorphic. So it shoots weird flares off. Like, Interesting. It's like, it's like an, did you buy it modified or did you modify it? I modified. It came from the Ukraine actually. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's just Ukraine. It's not the Ukraine. But yeah, it was on made, eBay or yeah, it's it, it took like four months to come. But it was it's made in the former Soviet Union. Like it's a really old it's an lens. old lens. Yeah. yeah, and I use it a little bit. It's at night. It's really cool. It's almost like too this cool. is too much. Like it's, it's like, like the, how it all swirls. You have you're to like, have Whoa. like a really like artistic client. Like I could use that for Kamui because he's like, he owns a Leica and like, I find like, gets I it. find that the Japanese clients, they're just like much more creative people and they just, they understand art. So they're like, yeah, great. You know, like I couldn't use that for most of my clients, but he'd be cool. Cause they'll it. be like, why does it look like that? And you're like, what do you mean? And it looks then, great. I don't know what you're talking about. The other ones I have, if you go to, if you go to my Instagram, watch the video I made for Kamui Kobayashi at uh, Fuji Speedway in Japan. There's an effect in that that people are like, how'd you do that blur effect? It's not done in post. It's done in a lens. That's a lens baby. Was that the, the Helios specifically? No, it's a lens baby. What's a lens baby? So a lens baby is a Learning very stuff. affordable, about $400 tilt shift lens. And basically what you do is you buy what's called the composer, which is the piece that flexes. I should have brought it with me, but like it just, hmm. I'll, I'll send, I'll send you some photos of it. Okay. So basically it flexes and you can control where the bokeh goes in the image. So, ah. so I can move it to the right. So the right part of the frame is in focus. And then you put different optics in the composer to create different types of effects. I think I've seen, I've seen a tilt shift effect with a, I've mm. seen the interesting it's 400 bucks. Huh. And I, I saw I get you a guy use that. it in Abu Dhabi earlier this year at a race. And I was like, what the hell is that? He's like, Oh, is this like lens baby? And I was like, great. So I own that now I'm stealing that. And I just <laughs> bought one and like, Blows people's minds. They're like, "How did you do that?" And I'm like, "It's done in the lens." I'm like, "No way." I'm like, "No, seriously." And it's like 400. Yeah, bucks. I'm gonna have to ask you to show me examples. Almost later. nobody uses it in um, video. It's mostly marketing photography. to photography. But 
there's a few of us doing it and it's really cool. And I think, I feel like that's one of those deals where like if Peter McKinnon made a video about it, they'd sell a million in a yeah. second. Like, but it's so unique. Like it's, there's only it's a, a very few. specific scenario. So I used it in one video at spa overnight to show the engineers like on the data station. Cause it kind of gives that vibe of like, fuck, we're tired. It's the middle of the night. It has that sort of like really interesting, like glow about it. So it's just another thing in your arsenal to like make shit interesting. Yeah. You know, interesting. Okay. No, I, I, I I'm really just the gear part of it. I'm not a big gear head, but mm -hmm. it's really interesting to hear what's the, the tips and things, the tricks that you have in your bag for something like that with all the lenses and even, and even, and even things like that. Do you pick up a lot of that stuff too, from other photographers and videographers you yes. work with? That's yeah. most of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, cause I know I figure like the, the creative community in motorsports, pretty tight knit as well. We all, yeah, everybody knows everybody and yeah. like it's there's not a lot of us doing it, right? And and we all inspire each other and and there's not really like stealing, it's more just like you're inspired by somebody else and you but there's even days when like I have a laptop shade and sometimes when I'm editing I'll put it on even though there's no glare because like it hurts my neck to, sh to edit that way but like I maybe don't want people to see the cool part of the track that I discovered that I don't want you gotta else to know. You got to keep some secrets in your bag. I'll tell you after the weekend's over, right? So for yeah. next time you come back. But yeah, like it's just yeah, asking people questions. Oh, where did you go? Like, where, where's that from? And they'll like tell you, you know, like, and be like, oh yeah, it's from this location. Okay, cool. Because we're all kind of on, well, since we're all competing against each other, you're all kind of on the same team. Yeah, it's a, a weird mix for sure. Yeah, so it's, but there are definitely like, we don't get along with everybody, but like you have to be civil with everyone. Because, yeah, because like, you're sharing a space. You're traveling, for... like working in these media centers with the same people. You're seeing the same people at so many different events. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's good to be, that's like, that kind of leads into, I don't know if we're talking about the freelance thing, leads into like just being like, and you know, yeah, that's, that, that's what we were. Uh, what I was going to kind of segue into next is like, as someone who runs their own business in the sports world, like, um, what's what's been the biggest key for you in maintaining your career freelance? Like, a lot of people are kind of intimidated by the mm -hmm. idea of having to live from client to client. How yeah. did you kind of develop your business and, and your freelance, um, your freelance career, and how do you kind of find clients and and charge them and reach out? Like what's your creative process from the business side of things? So it's definitely scary, right? Like I think I have to first off acknowledge that like the only reason I was able to go freelance is because my wife made enough money to support both of us. Mm -hmm. So I'll There's a, yeah. acknowledge that privilege for sure. I was only able to do it because if I had a couple slow months, we weren't going to lose our house, right? So fine. So that was really helpful. But a lot of it is just, you have to Freelancing is not for everyone. And I never will be in a position where like, oh, I think I'm better than people that don't freelance. It's usually the better creatives are freelance because they can make more money. But that's not always true because to be a freelancer, you have to be a business owner. You have to be someone who can do all your own. Well, I don't do my own books. I hired an accountant. I hire people that are experts at things, right? You know, yeah. so people hire me to make videos because they don't know how to make videos, right? So I don't know how to do taxes or hire a guy. But anyway, you have to like manage your own receipts. You have to do your own invoicing. You have to find your own clients. You have to keep your clients happy. You have to do all of your own negotiating. And it is very stressful. And a lot of it, the most important thing is there are a lot of people doing this and making a living that are incredibly mid, that are just not that great. Mm -hmm. But- they know how to market themselves. They could sell water to a fish. Exactly. They are personable and they're just friends with people because they've had clients for 10, 12 years and they're, you know, they're, we're going to keep using this person because that's who we know. Yeah. Right? And they're easy to work with. We they're know them. They're friendly. With, you know them. You know, everything's great. They get everything done. And it's all like the biggest thing is just being personable and being likable. Being a nice person. People want to hire their friends. I want to hire my friends, right? People, nepotism is real. I like, I want to hire people I like. I don't want to hire some guy who's a dick. Like, it's like, oh, he's the best videographer in the world, but he's a fucking I was, asshole. I always say that you can be the most talented person in the room with a camera, but if you have a bad attitude or you, if, if you there, come there, in. There's like this one photographer I know, I'm not going to name them, but like they'd have way more work if they weren't a complete dick to, every, to almost everybody, right? Amazing Me. photographer, but just a complete asshole. So it's like they it's rub, sets you down they rub so many people the wrong way, right? They'd have way more clients and way more work, but that's, that's the biggest thing. And then also just being reliable. The biggest thing is fucking being reliable because there are so many people that aren't reliable. There are so, I just got a gig for next year because someone said, Hey, we fired the person we worked with. I quoted them. They went with someone who was cheaper and they said, this person never hit any of the deadlines. So we're going to, if it's okay, we're going to come, you know, hat in hand back to you. Can you do it for us next year? I said, yeah, sure. This is the price. Okay, we'll do it because they just didn't deliver. 
They were like, oh, sorry, I didn't have a chance to get it done today. Bullshit. That's not an excuse. You have to respond. You have to, you have respond. to hit your deadlines. You have to, if you're saying this will be done by seven o'clock tonight, you have to tell, you have to get it done. That's why you under promise. You always under promise and you over deliver, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's the biggest thing to be reliable. Deliver your content when you say you're going to deliver it. That's the biggest thing. And, and people will be Happy. right up there and respond to messages and be, you know, the biggest thing is like, your clients are going to want to change stuff. Your clients are going to want to change the deal. They say, oh, can you do this instead? Do this, And just not being defensive right away and being like, or if you get feedback and you're defensive about it, you're like, oh, well, this is why I did it. Relax. My biggest thing, and I'm still struggling with this, but I'm getting better, is I try to wait an hour before I respond to any emails. You might get an, an email that annoys the hell out of you. Just wait an hour. Take a second. Let wait it, an hour. Let it simmer. It. Even Because there's even been times in my life where like I thought like a server was rude to me or something. And then you think about it after you're like, no, I could have approached that situation a lot better. Yeah, when you're kind of confronted, like put in a situation like that, like, taking, yeah. a, taking the time just, to simmer down. Just just chill because it's not that big a deal. And just think, okay, because the biggest thing I say in negotiation is like the biggest part of negotiation, you'll always have an upper hand if you consider the other person's situation. So empathy, Not there's a lot of people that don't have any emotional intelligence or any empathy. Okay? Yep, yep, yep. I work in car racing. I know a lot of these people, okay? But it's like if you can consider where the other person is coming from, and just think about what their position is like, what they're going through, what their budget might be. It's going to give you an upper hand in that negotiation, right? You're always going to be one step ahead. And it's just, it's just an important thing in life, not even just in freelancing. It's just like put yourself in other people's shoes, right? And think about... Everyone's in a different situation. And you, exactly. know, and you can't just assume people are like fine. Like be, being a dick to you because they just want to be... Like there might be something going on. Now, now, now... Rough stuff going on in your life is never an excuse to be an oh, asshole yeah. no, to people. It I doesn't agree. give you free license to be a dick, but still, it's just like it's important to like take some time. You get an annoying email from a client, just take some time, think about it, okay? Simmer down a little bit and then email back, right? Because yeah. you're going to be super frustrated right away, especially in the middle of an event. If you're like, oh, come on, like I'm in the middle of doing this, right? Just relax. It's all fine. We'll get to the it. The sun will rise tomorrow. Yeah, I got Everything you. will be fine. So when it comes to um, charging and pre pricing, not something I've talked about a lot, but you mm -hmm. work in a very unique field. Um, how have you kind of built out your kind of pricing structure and your, the rates you offer? I'm not asking you to tell me your yeah, rates. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, you know, I think people who want to freelance primarily, that's a, for me, I work full time. But like one of the things, yeah. I, even now I'm still figuring out, having done this for six years, is like, Figuring out people, your your self worth as a creative. What's kind of the, your process there for the people who want to take this freelance journey in the sports world, specifically in racing? So I'm very much uh, project based. I'm very anti the idea of working hourly. I think that working hourly is just punishing yourself. If you're yeah, I, I agree. It's right. I, I only like charge by the project. Yeah, like so the, the the famous story of the woman that designed the city financial logo. Took her 15 minutes. She doodled it on a napkin. They sold it for several million dollars. People are like, well, it took 15 minutes to make. Right. So should she only get paid for 15 minutes? No, because like that's one of the best logos ever designed and it's mm -hmm. going to make them boat loads of money. So a lot of it when you're pricing things out depends on what the situation is. So obviously there's travel involved. Now, so say I did Dubai 24 this year. I did it for one client. I paid a day rate or we did. We didn't do a day rate. We did. This is what I want. And then you had to pay for all my expenses because I have to come all the way there. Right? Yeah. So, so the I, expenses for you are like a non-negotiable. You have to pay. Yeah. For but when I'm doing events where it's like I'm doing this event and I have four or five clients, I won't charge each one for expenses. I'll just charge a rate that is fair for the work. And then the expenses are kind of built in the idea of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll just budget like, Hey, so every event in the U S for example, I try to budget like 15 to 1700 for expenses. That's going to be like your flight, your rental car and your hotel. And then you try, what we do is I share with other freelancers. So like in Daytona next year and, and this past year, we booked a house as five bedrooms. And that's why like everyone, I see so many TikTok videos like never book Airbnbs, always stay in hotels. It's cheaper. Not when you're not when there's five of you, it's not cheaper. So yeah. we do a lot of Airbnbs. We do a lot of house, house rentals and booking.com verbo stuff like that, because we can share like, you know, it's 300 bucks a night for the house and there's four of us sleep, staying there. So it brings the price way down. Yeah. Right. When hotels, you each have to have your own room. So it's much more expensive, but flights are kind of like flights or whatever they are. They're flights. You can't get around it. Right. They're going to cost money. Um, I don't fly on dark garbage airlines. I refuse to do that. I want to fly on a decent airline. So, uh, yeah. And I'll just kind of charge based on what, what I want to get out of an event, mm -hmm. right? Okay. After all is said and done. And it, and it has to make sense for the amount of work. But what I end up having a lot of the time is like, clients will say to me like, how much to hire you for a race you're already going to? So let me translate that. That's how much will you charge me or, or I want to hire you, but I don't want to pay for any of your expenses. 
that's not really fair to my other client who's paying all my expenses. Not at all. Right? It's like, so it's, it's really weird to try and work. So what do you do in that situation? You just say no. Or you say, well, you got to help cover some of my expenses. I'm working for these other people. Right. But usually I do non-exclusive contracts. Like I'll say to people like, Hey, like I'm going to do this for, I'm going to charge you less overall and you're paying for my expenses, but I can take another gig if I want. Right. And they're like, okay, cool. So I did that like for Dubai 24. I had this little tiny side gig and it was fine. But usually it's just, I'm just now at the manufacturer level, it's all like, here's, here's a flat rate for the event to get this amount of content. I'm like, okay, great. Nice. And the travel don't really worry about because it it's just, it can build that into the price. Yeah. So yeah, but a lot of the time, yeah, it's just, it's uh, flights. And like I did a deal this year uh, for this driver from the UK where um, he got my hotel, I paid for my flight and then I could have other clients. Boom. So something like that. It's right? a compromise. at the Exactly. End of the day. So he was able to cover the hotels. I gave him a little discount because he paid for the hotels and it was actually de- nice, decent hotels too. It wasn't bad. So and I still did my own my own rental car, or I said, well, I want to say hire car because that's what they say in Europe. And I spent so much time in Europe this year. Hire car, hire, hire cars. I've also started saying mate a lot because <laughs> I hang out with so many British. So people. many British guys. God, it's killing me. Uh, but yeah, so and then you just kind of work out your expenses from there. But yeah, it's there's not really like an absolute science to it. Like it's but so situational. When I'm working for like an agency or something, it's like this is my day rate, and then you got to cover my expenses. Yep. and that's pretty standard. Yeah. Okay. So. Good to know. Um, we talked a little bit there, you, you, the flying part of it, and we one thing I wanted mm-hmm. to touch on here um, is the reality of what it's like to fly across the world on a consistent mm-hmm. basis. People who don't work in sports see it, and like you get to go to all these countries, you get to yes. go to all these places. It's amazing. You must have such a great uh, time, and I'm sure most of the time it is. From someone who's traveled a lot for work as well, it is. But the travel isn't as luxurious as it seems. No, no, no. You are flying for a long. Give us a little ins- okay. insight of all what right. it's actually so, like to to travel for your job. So that's kind of a meme. Is the whole like, oh, it's so great that you get to like travel and see all these countries. Most of the time, what I see of that country is the airport. And then the racetrack. Mm-hmm. That's all I ever see. So you don't really ever have time just to kind of be a tourist well, in that country. Unless you pay extra money and you go early, right? So this yeah. year I did yeah, that yeah. when I went to Japan. So I spent four days in Tokyo and it was amazing. I purposely. I can, I can imagine. Coolest country I've ever been to. It's number one for sure. I also did that when I went to Australia last year. I stayed for an extra ten days. You make it, you make a trip out of the work trip at the end of the day. Yes. Yeah. So like my wife and I went to Europe this year for one of my events, and we went ten days early and did vacation, and then I shot the race, and then we came back. Right. So we tried to do that a little bit. So I did get to enjoy some time in Europe this year. We went to Bruges. We went to uh, Normandy. We explored like northern France. So we stayed a little bit in uh, Germany. We went to Luxembourg and Belgium. So we went around. Right. But. Most of the time it's in and out. Like I went to Bahrain and landed at the airport and went into Manama to my hotel and I literally went back and forth to the racetrack every day and left. Didn't see any of Bahrain. Now granted, Bahrain's as big as this table, so there's not really <laughs> a lot to see, but- um, Bahrain's des- as big as this it's, table. It's a desert, right? There's not really a lot to see, even like Dubai. So I did a little bit of exploring. The first time I went to Dubai this year, didn't see anything. Just flew into Dubai, went to the racetrack, boom, back and forth to the hotel and went home, right? And then the second time I did Dubai and then Abu Dhabi the next weekend, we had one day off in between and we just went around and like, Oh, Burj Khalifa. Cool. Big right? towers, big buildings. Oh, uh, in, uh, skiing indoors, you know, in all the they, Emirates. Can, they, they do that. Yeah. There's a ski hill. Indoors That's insane. In all the Emirates. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's pretty crazy. But even like recently, so I went to Malaysia, we did one day, went into Kuala Lumpur, went to the Batu caves and like, we saw some stuff, right? Because we planned to shoot some scenics and that kind of turned into my buddy Michaeli went like shopping at the just Christmas shopping at the mall there. But yeah, mostly it's just to and from the racetrack and, and we're flying economy 95% of the time, unless you're paying to upgrade yourself. So I did fly business to Kuala Lumpur from Amsterdam. I used all my points. So I upgraded to business. It was amazing. And on the way back, I paid upgrade to premium economy, which How? is like slightly better than economy. So like, but usually we're just flying economy and you're just sitting in the back. Now there's a YouTuber, this guy who shoots F1 races, this old guy. I think I know who you're talking yeah, about. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm an F1 photographer. He shoots F1 races for fun. He's independently wealthy. He's just a YouTuber who shoots F1 races. And people think that that's what our job is like. He flies business and first class and stays in five-star hotels because he's independently wealthy. That's not what it's like. Like we're like, I've slept on the floor and stuff to try and save money. Like, do you guys have an extra like couch in your Airbnb? No, but you can sleep on the floor. Great. I'll bring my air mattress. You just sleep on the floor, right? Because you're trying to save money. Yeah, no, for sure. The less I could spend, the more I make, right? So we rent houses a lot. A lot of time it's sharing a room to, you know, two beds in one room and you're sharing for a week, like stuff like that. And it's, it's not 
what it's not as glamorous as people think. How it do is. you take care of yourself during this? Like you're traveling a lot. It's hard on the body, like yep. long times on planes. How do you make sure you're not just burning out and, and being a, like, you know, dead in the water by the end of the year? Like, how are you making sure you're taking care of yourself during the long, the long weeks and, and months? A couple times this year, um, we're not great. I threw my back out twice this year because <sighs> I have a back injury. My, my SI joint in the right side of my back is like, I heard it a few years ago. So it flares up every now and then. Um, so not great. I had to go to events like, that week so like it was not fun brutal but um, brutal got through it a lot of painkillers a lot of stretching but really it comes back to taking care of yourself so mm-hmm. physical fitness is very important for me so this year i, I said to myself hey every event i'm going to try and go for at least two runs right like moving staying fit yeah, moving your body we're going to the gym at the hotel things yeah. like that and like I, I, my goal this year was to run a thousand kilometers over the course of the year i need to run 134 more kilometers by the 31st that's gonna be really tough but i have to make them up because there's a few weeks i missed like when i first trip to dubai i didn't exercise at all because i was jet lagged and tired but most of the time i made it out to go for runs and stuff i ran a lot of the racetracks this year so you go on my strava you can see i like track maps like running the racetrack it's a really cool thing to do um, so I did that, try to stay fit and just have a goal in mind for my fitness. Um, and that's helped a lot. Like I actually shockingly have not been sick once this year. That's awesome. With all the traveling. And I think it's, that's I rare too. do like a vitamin mix every day, vitamin C and stuff. And I do my training and I eat healthy when I'm on the road. It's healthy as again. We do have a lot of pizza hut. That's a kind of become a joke now. Yeah. I've pizza, seen that on your socials. Pizza pizza you, thing. So you go to the pizza huts and I'm trying like, to get a deal with pizza hut. Pizza hut Canada wants to do a pizza hut. Deal. If you see this, like honestly, my guy up like, here. Cause like I've had pizza hut and like, I try to go to every country I've been to. I try to have pizza hut as a joke. <laughs> right. So like I had it in, in Malaysia. It was not great. How, not great. Not great. What's the best pizza hut so far you've been to in not the North America. Luxembourg. Interesting. What made it so good? I had it in a sit down pizza hut cause I still oh. have those there. And it came out in that sizzling like pan Ooh. and it was unreal. And everything in Europe tastes better. Cause it's like less grease and it's like real ingredients. And That's like, crazy. You, like you go to Europe, you can eat bread all day and not feel like shit. You have one piece of bread here and you're like, fuck, I'm dead. You know? Mm-hmm. So that's the one thing I love about Europe is just like the food is unbelievable. And it's just, it's been great getting to travel this year though. And seeing like different cultures and experiencing different things. Like as much as a lot of time we're just going back and forth to the racetrack. And kind of the weird thing about that is like, as much as you're traveling over the world, as soon as you're at the racetrack, it could be anywhere in the world and you wouldn't even know. Yeah, you're it's, just dialed the international in. language of motorsport. It's the same everywhere. Yeah, no you're just dialed you're, in. Everyone's speaking English at the racetrack and like, it's crazy. So, you know, if you're in Bahrain, you're in Malaysia, you're in Japan, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. So yeah. it could you could be anywhere. So another day, another day at the track, learn the circuit, where are we going? Okay, boom, and we're done, right? Media center and we're home. So yeah, but it's been, it's been cool. Like, but again, traveling is tough, is tough, but it's, there's, a few things you learn as you go, like with, you know, I got a travel credit card, things like that. Like I got an Amex so I can get lounge access at airports. That's kind of made it a lot better because you don't have to sit at the gate. You don't have to spend money on food. You can just go to a lounge, right? Which is nice. Have a shower before you get on the plane or if you're on a long layover. So that's a big thing. Get an Amex. If you have, if you own a business and you're making decent money, get an Amex, like the platinum so you can get all that included. Interesting. Yeah. I highly recommend you do that. If you want my uh, code for a referral, <laughs> you know, get 20,000 points So <laughs> if I refer you. So yeah. So Subtle that's, plug. That, no, that's, that, no, those are yeah. all great insights insights and i think people need to know that like there is the reality of the situation like it's a grind Mm -hmm. and people will say that but you don't not until you experience it will you understand um one thing i want to shift gears into is kind of like the social media growth that you've had um specifically specifically on like things like tiktok and instagram um but one thing we you you and i really want to talk about is kind of like the younger creative generation yes um and kind of the the reality that you know, I think we're not that people are unfortunately sold thinking that it's this, that you're going to make this jump right away to the professionals, not understanding you have to apply your trade. Yeah. Um, there was something you wanted to kind of bring up on there and I'll let you kind of take that away. Like in terms of like how younger creatives can build a career in this, in this day and age as a, as a sports creative. So it, you should definitely shoot for the stars, but like you don't have to get there today. That's the thing people don't understand. Like <clears throat> everyone that wants to work like in football, they're like, I want to shoot the NFL. Yeah. It's like, you need to shoot local football, high first, school ball, high school football, college football. You have to like start and, and get your skills. And it's like, you can't go right to the top right away. Right. It's just, it's not how it works. Like you don't like my buddy, Jamie price. He always says, you don't walk in your first day of medical school and be like, okay, scalpel, let's do heart surgery. They're like, no, that's not how it works. Like you have to like learn and develop. Right. And everyone wants to go straight to F1. The amount of people that message me, I really want to get a job in F1. Like, how do I get a job in F1? And I'm like, what racing have you shot? And they're like, none. I'm like, right. So like you, you want to go straight from off the street to playing in the NFL. Like that's not how it works. Like 
Now, it's I'm very sure similar to an I mean, athlete. Like, oh yeah, but this person, there's always going to be an outlier or a nepotism situation or whatever, but it's like 99% of people, you have to cut your teeth doing something else. You can't just go straight to working in Formula One. You want to start lower and you don't just have to work in F1 as much as you like Formula One. You can still work in motorsport. There's hundreds of different racing championships you could work in and make good, good living shooting. Like even my buddy, Jamie, he shot everything you can imagine. He only does one or two F1 races a year because he makes more money doing sports car racing. Right. And same thing with me. Like it'd be cool to shoot IndyCar. It'd be cool to shoot NASCAR. I make way more money shooting sports cars. So that's why I do it. Right. And I think you need to start at the bottom, go to your, go to your local racetrack, just bring your camera, go to a car meet. Everyone's like, how can I get experience? There's no tracks near me. And then I'll usually say, where do you live? And then they're like, here, and I'm like, there's, and I look it up on Google Maps, I'm like, there's three racetracks within an hour drive of you. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I'm like, well, it's not like what I want to shoot. I'm like, yeah, but go to a car meet, go to a track day, whatever. If your just, body has a nice car, go meet shoot that. people. Yeah. Go do some illegal rollers on a back road. I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> just wear a harness. Um, but yeah, like, just start, start some, start somewhere smaller. And people are like, oh, well, I don't, I can't have enough money to buy a camera. How can I learn, you know, how to shoot with your phone? You can learn composition with your iPhone. 100% you can. Download one of those free apps that has better control your camera. I think that's like one of the biggest things. Like, just go out there and do the thing just before. Just do shit. There's always something you can shoot, mm -hmm. right? Like, that, and that's And I think thing. you run into a lot of those comments and stuff on social media. Uh, you know, like people like assuming that it's like that easy to get up there. That all being said, kind of around like, you know, starting at the bottom and not being, like, it's not <laughs> being a bad thing. Um, apart from shooting... Um, local events and starting at the lowest, like at, the, at those levels to build your skill set. What's other advice you have for people who are coming into this industry? Well, I think the big thing, like I said before, is just be personable, learn communication skills. Cause like there's so many people, like the, earlier this year, I think you made a TikTok about this, like having DM, uh, yo, uh, what is it? Um, etiquette. Like, and people in the comments were like, it's ridiculous. The DM, you don't have to be like nice. It's like, no, you still should be though, because it's a job. You're asking for a job. Yeah. Right? So I, I needed someone to cover an event in France, and I posted in the in my story. I need someone who's available this weekend, you know, to go to this event at in this France. racetrack. You you have to be local to the event or already shooting that championship, already a professional. The amount of people who had never shot a race before that emailed me or messaged me and they were just like, "Hey, I would love to shoot this. I'd love the opportunity." I'm like, "Where do you live?" They're like, "Detroit." I'm like. Well, this is in France. Like, I need, and it's this weekend, and I need someone to shoot. Kudos for them just shooting their shot. Yeah, but yeah, like, great. But it's like, I, I appreciate it. But like, the amount of DMs I got that were just like, yo, or the waving emoji. I'm like, what, do you, what the hell do you want me to do with that? Like, yeah. You know who I ended up going with? A guy that messaged me and said, hi, Mark, uh, I'm this person. I shoot this championship. Here's some of the previous work that I've done. I'd love to work with you. Let me know. It's Ooh, all about that's who I lang with. language and proper communication that, skills yeah. are so underrated, but it's like, and I, I just saw a YouTube video about this, like about how people go and behind like go, um, kind of around networking the wrong way. It's like people will reach out to you and like, this happens with me all the time. It's like people reach out to me like, Hey, I'd love to pick your brain. Love to sit down and talk for an hour and hear about, you know, I got, how did you got into the industry and how I could potentially do it? That's great. Yep. But there's a problem there. It's you are you it's 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 a lot of I want you to do this for me on your time and there's yeah. no return like how why is it beneficial for me and I love helping people yeah. but there's like a communication thing here where like you have to make sure that there's like an equal value proposition for the person you're even if it's for oh, yeah. a gig like you know proper communication hey this like, mm -hmm. like you said this is who I am. This is what I do. I would love to help you out. But again, yeah. like <clears throat> it's just a communication thing that people need to understand. It's the most important thing with finding opportunities, yeah. especially at the, when you're young and starting up. I get that a lot. I get probably weekly basis. People are like, hey, I'd really love to pick your brain. Hop on a like, Zoom call. I just got like a weird like message once is like, hey, Mark, love your work. Like I want to get in this industry. What's three things that I should be doing? And I'm like, what a weird thing. To, it was just, it just seemed like very much like alpha podcast guy thing to like text me, you know, mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about? But I also have people asking me to, to, to shadow me all the time. Like, hey, can I come with you to a race? It like, doesn't I'll work, work like for that. Free. I'm like, I can't just get you a media pass. This is a very unsafe position to be in. Like, this is not a safe area when you're track side of a racetrack. You can be killed doing this. And it's also like, I, I have to vouch for you. And so, I don't know you. And I don't know you. Now, I did let someone shout at me this year. I let Bruce from O Canada Creative shout, shout at me at, at Most Board, and he did an amazing job. But he's a professional videographer. He just never shot racing before. I said, sure, you can come with me. He came Friday, Saturday. He did an amazing job, and I'm probably going to hire him for some stuff. So, you know, and, and but again, it's like I stick my neck out to do that. I got him the deal. And if they fuck up, it's your neck. He did an amazing job, and I was like, great, awesome. I'm going to try and hire him for some stuff now. Yeah. So, yeah, it was fantastic. But, you know, a lot of the time it's like, yeah, can we hop on a Zoom call? I'm like, again, I don't want to be an asshole, but it's like, 
I I don't have time to. And just I think that's a really big mentor thing. you for nothing because yeah. like I, my time is so. Have valuable. you thought about mentoring? But like, do like you're like getting a, a bill for this. I hope you know yeah. that. Yeah. So, uh, but it's like, it's just like. I don't have time for that. Like yeah. my time is so valuable now with how much. I and I think that's important them. to know that like you have to add, if you want someone to mentor you or talk to them, add a little value proposition. Like if they're in your area, offer to buy them lunch or maybe mm-hmm. say, Hey, I know your time, your time is worth something. Like I could throw you X amount of money. Like yeah, I think yeah. that's a good thing to keep in mind. Like people's times are, time is really valuable. And when you're traveling, working all the time, it is hard to, to make that time for people as much as you want to help. Yeah. But also Someone like you, you're putting a lot of free resources for people to access information wise, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. Yes, and I get, a, I get accused of being a gatekeeper all the time. First thing, I wouldn't talk about my gears. You're being such a gatekeeper. I'm like, my TikTok account has a, t- a playlist called how to get my job. If I was a gatekeeper, would I really my have thing that? To, my thing to do is like now when people <laughs> ask me like specific questions, I'm like, hey, I have a lot of content on this topic, I would recommend go checking it out first. Got to make a most asked questions video. That's what I did on YouTube. Most asked questions. I just send people the link now and then I usually get another YouTube subscriber. And then, that's okay. That's good just, to know. Just most ask, asked. Here's my most asked questions. It's included in that. Go watch this. Good video to know because okay. like I'm tired of answering these questions. Yeah, no, so. I mean, I, it, it does get exhausting and it's like, you want to help as many people as possible, but at the same time, like, yeah. There's only so many. So many I, th- I think one day I'd like to teach. I think that's how I'm going to give back. Like, have I'd you thought like, about doing a mentorship like program? Yeah, I've, I've thought about it. I, I, yeah, I thought about doing like workshops. I'm, I might do a workshop with my buddies uh, Jamie and Drew. They do like a photography yeah. workshop, which I'll plug. Yep, yep. It's called uh, Paddock Focus. If you want to like get involved in motorsport photography, it's like it's fifty bucks an episode, I think, and they do like a four hour workshop on specific things. They're even doing one now about like how to price your work, which is like incredible. So uh, it's think, we're just investing back in your education. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. It's, it just makes sense. Like even myself, like I, the uh, art of doc documentary you're familiar with them yeah yeah Yeah, like i'm i'm i invest in one of the classes and i'm learning so much and like even at this level it's just like just reinvest investing in gear is one thing but investing in your education and growth just just don't just don't buy any of those courses from those people that guarantee they're going to get you a bunch of clients yes that's That's all bullshit don't like if they're not teaching you skills and they're like oh here's how you're going to get clients they're all full of shit Mm -hmm. and all their testimonials are fake so uh, (laughs) those people are leeches um but yeah um, you wanted to talk also a little bit about more about Le Mans. Okay, so, yeah, we, so I before should, we wrapped up. I, this is one thing I definitely want to talk about is like if you, it's the ultimate 24 hour race. Now I've heard Nürburgring is the hardest one, but let's talk about Le Mans. First time I did it this year, it's it's a week event. You get there Monday, like you're shooting on Monday. You're shooting like driver lineup videos and a bunch of piddling crap that you don't want to do. You're doing helmet videos for drivers because every driver has a special helmet for Le Mans. So you have to do a helmet reveal video for 14 drivers, right? You're doing all this work Tuesday. You got practice on Wednesday. You're working until eight, nine shooting. Le Mans is a fever dream in the way that the track is so big. It's 13 kilometers. When I go to the far side of the circuit to shoot at like the Indianapolis corner, when I go out there, I have to ride my scooter to the gate, scan out, leave the circuit, drive down the public roadway on my scooter, turn left at the paint factory, you know, go down this road, then down this dirt road. And it's like 20 minutes of driving to get to one of the corners. And I did that at like four in the morning at one point when it's pitch black, you couldn't see anything. And I was like, I only had regular lights or the brights on the scooter. So I was like, holding my finger between the two. So both would be on because it was Mm. so dark. And then the cars come, I can't see anything. But then also the Friday of the event, you've got like this parade, the Le Mans, the famous Le Mans parade where like the drivers go in these old timey cars through the city and the driver lineups. And then they throw stuff out to the fans, like AliExpress, like wristbands, like garbage, right? Yeah. That people will physically like punch a child in the face for it to get. Like you've never seen (laughs) Like I'm going to have nightmares of people yelling (coughs) monsieur at me when like one of the things falls on the ground and they want me to pick it up and hand it to them. And it was just like, it's the seventh circle of hell, but also the most amazing thing you've ever filmed in your life. Cause it's so great. Cause you point a camera at the fans and they do exactly what you need them to do. Right. And then you got race day where it's like, you have to get there at 8 AM and the race starts at four. You have to get, you have to get there by eight just to beat traffic to the racetrack. And then you park a hundred miles from the media center because the, the way they a lot parking at racetracks is whoever has the most equipment, you have to park the farthest away. I think that's how they do it. They're like, if you're a writer with a laptop bay, you can park right next to the media center. But if you have a bunch of equipment, oh, no, 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 you're parking, you know. Way back. You're parking at the airport. So, um, and then you do the whole race, the whole day, you've got the pre-race, you've got all these things leading up to it. And then you've got the podium afterwards. And this year, it was my first year doing it, the fans rushed the podium. So it was just, you're surrounded by people like try, you're trying to get your shot and you're trying to like people with their cell phone getting us literally getting a Snapchat video. And you're like, come on, I just want to get my yeah, shot. I need to do my job. <laughs> it's just like, 
Yeah, it, 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 I ended up tweeting about that, and people were like, "Just let people have fun." And I'm like, "I just want to. I'm just trying to do my job, you know." Like, so it was the craziest thing I've ever done, and I think one of the craziest events ever. And then once you're done, like, you can't sleep. You're so awake for so long. There's actually a video on my TikTok of me. I fell asleep at my desk, sitting upright like this. I fell asleep, <laughs> like, sound asleep. And I said to my buddy, "How long was I sleep?" He's like, "Maybe three minutes." And I was like, "Okay, great." So yeah, and it was it's just one of the toughest things I've ever done. It's it's such a cool event though. Like it's the it's the, it sounds it's like a bucket list. The worst right? event you'll ever do in your life, but, but it's, it's also the best. The best. And it was the 100th Le Mans, so it was like such iconic. a big deal. It was iconic. It was all the new cars for this year, all the new prototype cars. It was just an incredible event to be involved in. Like That's it was, amazing. It was, it was cool. I had clients on the podium, which was awesome. And like getting to shoot the celebration was really when I kind of come full circle when I was leaning out the, the, the window and the car came by and the whole crew was there like cheering. And I was like, this is insane. This is crazy. And that's when it kind of hits you. I used to you, watch like, documentaries I, about this. And now it hits you like, Oh, I'm here. I get to You're cover like, wow. it. Wow. And like, I still have moments like that where I'm like trackside and I'm like, Somebody pinch me. This is insane. Mm -hmm. like, what no, it's good that you, I always talk about that. Like, you want to take those, 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 yeah. those moments to like, remember those like, Oh my God, I'm here. Cause I tell people all the time that it's still the job, but it's the best job ever. Yeah. Like it's like, but there are days when it will be like a job. And, and one of the biggest stigmas I find on social media is that when people with cool jobs complain about them, people get really upset. They're like, Oh, shut up. You have a job that everyone would want to do. And it's but like, it's still a, it's still a fucking it's still a job. Man. Sometimes like, you have, sometimes like, I don't like, like my job. People always say it's about formula one mechanics. They're like, we want to have less races. There's 24 races. We're on the road so much. They're like, Oh, shut up. You knew what you were signing up for. And it's like, no, when I signed up, we had 17 races. Now we have 24. Right. And it's like, well, you can quit then if you don't like it. It's like, that's such a shitty way to look at life. Yeah. It's not, it's not a positive. It's way just people that want everyone else to have a rough time because they had a rough time. A hundred percent. I would love for people not to have to pay for tuition. It was annoying. Mm -hmm. you know? No. Yeah. I totally so, get that. Yeah. That's a great perspective to have though. Well, and it's, like, it, and it's just, and it's just awareness too. But you want things to be easier for the next people, right? It's, yeah. like, it's just like, there's two types of people in this world. There's people that are like something bad happens to them and they're like, I'm going to be a dick now. Cause like this bad thing happened to me. So I'm also going to be spiteful. Dick. Yeah. And then there's people that are like, this bad thing happened to me. I never want that to happen to another person. Yeah. Right. You so, want to leave the place you were at better for the next people. Be that person. Yeah. Be that person. Exactly. Right. Um, kind of wrapping up here as we're getting, uh, really long on this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do some quick hits here. Okay. Just really quick questions. You can answer it in a really brief, like, uh, like sentence or whatever, just quick things that people probably want to know. Um, first off, what's your favorite camera brand? We already talked about this, but Sony, Sony, yeah. if you had to choose another camera brand, that's not Sony. I haven't really used anything else. Yeah. I don't all right. Oh, oh Fujifilm, because I have an Instax. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Fujifilm, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. If you could go with one lens for the rest of your career to shoot racing, what would it be and why? Um, 50 millimeter, 1.8 or 1.4, because I, I've always joked with my buddies that one day I'm going to shoot an entire race weekend on 50 millimeter. And I think I could do it pretty there was well. A, there was a, an Instagram reel I saw or someone on YouTube who's doing 50 videos in 50 days only on 50 millimeter. Like it is cool. so, it's, it's really interesting. Um, what is the best purchase you've made gear wise in your career? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the roller bag is pretty great. Uh, it's a Tenba bag. It looks like luggage. Love that. That's one of the best purchases ever. For me, it's my Nana case. Like one of the best things like, I've yeah. ever purchased. Like just unbelievable purchase. Yeah. But I think, I'm trying to think of like, people always ask me like, what's a really weird thing you've bought that's like really important? I'm like trying to think like what that would be. Uh, yeah, I can't really think of it. No, we'll go with the case. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's the worst purchase you've ever made? Like the board, like oh, I didn't need this. Why did I buy this kind of deal? Um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, I bought a 14 to 24, uh, F two eight, which I was like, when I was doing some vertical work, I'm like, I'll get the whole car in it. It looks stupid. You never shoot that wide. Like <laughs> okay. 14 millimeter. I've only used it like twice. Um, what's your dream event or race to shoot that you haven't shot already? The big one I want to do is the Bathurst 1000 in Australia. Uh, I've been to Australia to shot the Adelaide 500. It was amazing. But the Bathurst 1000 is one of the coolest races in the world. They basically race up and down a mountain, basically. Damn. I think I've seen this before. It's unreal. I really want to do it. Um, there's also a 12 hour GT race there that I might do next year, but like I need to do the 1000 because that's like the one. So that's the big one for me. Uh, what is your biggest creative pet peeve? Um, oh, my biggest creative pet peeve is when people use their shutter speed as ND. <laughs> um, that's my, like, I see this so much in, uh, like NCAA video, um, where like, I think it's because people are shooting everything at one twenty, 
and they'll just have the shutter at 250 because that's like the 180 that's like the the, the double the, yeah rule, the right? double reframe rule but they're just shooting like a locker room speech and it's like it looks jittery and like weird and like what the what do we do just shoot at 24 like or people that like i know people that do this in racing like there's this one guy who told me that he always has a shutter at 125 even when he's shooting 24 that makes no sense and i was like you're a psychopath <laughs> like it works for him but i'm like why it, it i would never do to that me, I, would, I would go insane it yeah. doesn't look real so I, yeah, like that's, that's my biggest thing is just not shutting your, setting your shutter speed properly. Um, but what about like when you're cranking your shutter to get a different effect? Well, that, so when you're doing it for a good reason, yes. Versus when, just being lazy. When you're like, oh, it's too dark. I'll just put my shutter at a thousand. It's like, this isn't photography. Okay. Like, <laughs> we can't, you can't do that. Buy an ND filter. What's the most overdone trend in the sports creative kind of industry right now that you're seeing on social media? Uh, the most overdone trend. Oh, I don't know. That's a good one. Um, yeah, that's tough. Like, there isn't really one. I think. Are you a guy who likes the trends on Instagram and TikTok? Oh, yeah, I like trending yeah. videos. I think. I think the biggest one is like, or maybe one that you like instead of being okay, overdone. Okay, like I think I, I like the multiple frame things. Yeah, like, I just I, made I a video. Lloyd about H. That. Photo was the first guy I ever saw do that. We need yeah. the five frames, and I. Stole it off him. I was like, I'm going to start doing that, and it's done really well. And For, actually, you know what? You know what? One, one that bothers me: the overdone, the color grading trends. Okay, yeah. So uh, I've done a few of those. I, I have to. I just I'm guilty. Put I'm out. guilty of it. I just yeah, think yeah. everyone does it these days, and just like okay. No, so the biggest one is okay when photographers, like the street photographer kids that use Sony's, do the before and after. And like the before is they did basically all they did was just crank the shadows. And it's like, why don't you just expose your image properly? <laughs> or when they're trying to show the dynamic range, you're like they show you like an image that's black, like, and then they're like, here's what it looks like edited. It's like, just expose the image properly and you won't have to do that. Yeah. You know? Or uh, AI generative. That's a big one. That's like, so that's a big one that's bothering me is people showing like how they've used AI to like make an image better. I have no issue if you use AI to remove a light pole or something like or that. Or something from the back. But backer. when you like someone at Nürburgring this year, like took, there's a corner that was like under construction and they made the whole thing look like grass, like normally does. And I'm like, that's bullshit because it doesn't look like that. Also, there was a guy a couple of years ago, there's a famous photo from the Bathurst 12 hour of kangaroos on the racetrack. It's not real. The kangaroos are Photoshopped in. Interesting. Bullshit. That is, I lost so much respect for the person that did that. Interesting. So more just like making it fake, like not showing the reality. Like it's, it, it's an ethical thing for me. I have no issue if you use practice footage and say it's the race. That's fine. That doesn't hurt. You can get away from that. doesn't hurt anyone. But you're, you're manipulating the image by adding the kangaroos <laughs> to make an event that didn't happen happen to get clout. That's bullshit. Okay. All right. No, fair take. Fair take. Uh, what was your first camera? Uh, Canon T3i. I still have it. What's your dream camera? I think I have it, the FX6. I FX6? Think I, lost, I think I have it, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, last question, and I kind of asked this before, but I'll leave it up to kind of anything else you want to add. What's one piece of advice you would give to a new creative or someone who wants getting in the field to follow if they want to be where you are? Or what's the one piece of advice you'd give to yourself back when you were starting off? The big piece of advice I'd give to myself is stop being a cringy weirdo. Um, don't take your guitar to parties. Stop being a bitch weirdo. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's probably a big one. Uh, just take things more, just take things more seriously. And I'm not saying you have to be like super serious and not have fun as a young person, but like, there's a lot of time that I spent wasted dicking around, look back on dicking around when I could have been, I could be crushing. I could have been doing this when I was 21 and I didn't start. I was like, I didn't start racing. Those 29. Mm -hmm. I could be like way, way further ahead. Right now. Yeah. So just so take the time you have, you have just right take now. the time to, to be serious, chase your passion a bit. I'm not saying you have to get up at four in the morning and take ice baths and all that bullshit, but like, just, you know, if you have a goal, work towards it. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to, you know, it doesn't have to become an obsession, but like, you don't need to go drinking tonight. You know what I mean? Like you can stay yeah. home and read a book if you want. Like, that's fine. And I didn't figure that out till like my final year of college. I was like, oh shit, I wasted a lot of time. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we all learn that in our, yeah, in our own exactly. ways. Right. So no, I think that's, that's a great piece of piece of advice to just make sure like, once you know what you want to do, like pursue it, like don't like fuck her. Cause time, time is valuable. We've yeah. talked about it the whole, the whole podcast. Um, anyways, as we wrap up here, uh, what do you, what's up, what's up next for you? You're leaving tomorrow. What's kind of the next okay, few months yeah, looking like? So, uh, it's Friday now. So Monday I have to leave to go to Austin to shoot a test for Lamborghini with their new prototype car. It's launching next year. That'd be really cool. I've never, actually I have done, I've shot testing before, but I've never done a private test. So they should have like the track rented out just for that test. So that's gonna be cool. I've never been to Circuit of the Americas before. So looking forward to it, another racetrack. Um, and then into next year, uh, basically the off season is only gonna be about a month. 
if not less, because we got to go to Daytona on the 17th of January for the 24 hours of Daytona. So do that. And then I come home for a day and I go back to the Middle East to shoot Asian Le Mans last two rounds. And then it all just snowballs from there. So, and then it's right back into, yeah, the, you've got the, the bigger the races. Mix. Like you've got Sebring 12 hour in March and like we do Le Mans again next June. Your so calendar is insane. It's pretty wild. Like, and people, someone asked me on TikTok, they said, well, what do you do in the winter? I said, I shoot racing. Like, but doesn't it snow? I'm like, doesn't mm. snow in Florida. It doesn't snow in the Middle East. We just race where there's you yeah. know, no snow. You go to where there's no snow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. No. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and chatting about your experiences and, and everything you've done in the motorsports world. Where can the people find you on uh, social media? What's your handle? Where can they so connect I'm with you? At M Urban, at Murban Video on every, I have the same handle on everything. Have the same handle on everything. Oh, another piece of advice I would give real quick. Go for it. Is have your name on your fucking Instagram. Don't, don't come up to me at a race. I appreciate when people come up to me and say, Hey, I love your work, but I don't know who you are. If you're like at some weird name, if you want people to know who you are, have it be your name. It's cool. If you have a company or whatever, but don't, be like, oh, I'm this person. Like, I don't know who you are. Like, are you still your, charging $50 your, for photos? Yeah, like, what's your, <laughs> what's your name on social media? You know, like, I need to know who you are. Yeah. Like, I, you know, if you're doing, like, whatever, like, you know, some weird, like, Apex Warrior or something, it's like, what? Like, yeah. just make so it easy to find. Just have it be your name. Yeah. Right? Be easy to find. So, yeah, Matt Ur- and Urban Video and everything. I have a YouTube channel now. Um, so go I'm subscribe. Doing, go follow him. YouTube TikTok, Instagram. Whatever else. So. Everything. Whenever uh, I have he made a great on. video on seven rules he'd make for the air f- for uh, for flying. Yeah, the seven rules um, for the, straight for to jail made me laugh and shit done. I heard them still. I'm like, no oh, fly list. If you cor- if you crowd the gate before your zone, you're on the no fly list. The one I the, the one I agree with is like the rules for each seat window. If the, you're in the window, you control the window. I don't care if it's 7 a.m. If I want the window open, I'm in the window. I can have the window open, right? I want to look at the majesty. Middle of aisle travel. gets both. Middle both armrests. Aisle gets the leg room. But, but you got to get up. If but you, you can't bitch if I have to get up to pee. Yeah, that's the, you're the gatekeeper. That's exactly. the responsibility. That's your job, right? So, so yeah, no. Yeah. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Um, everything for Mark, his social media, his YouTube will be linked below. Make sure to give him a follow. And that does it for episode 13 of the Sports Creative Showcase. Thank you again for coming on. And we'll catch you guys next time.